Good evening. Welcome to the November 6, 2023 Cabarrus County Board of Education Work and Business Session. I'd like to recognize our Teacher of the Year, Ms. Carrie Fugel, our board members, Brian Floyd, Sam Treadaway, Keisha Sandage, our Superintendent, Dr. John Kapicki, our Vice Chair, Rob Walter, board members, Laura Lindsay, Pam Escobar, our Attorney, Gil Middlebrooks, and our board clerk, Christy Spade. And thank you to our SRO who is here tonight. I will move to 1.01 .01 and I will call this meeting to order. I will move to 2.01 and 2.02. We will have our opening ceremony with the presentation of callers and the national anthem. Please stand. Presenting tonight's colors are members of the Central Cabarrus High School Air Force JRO TC program. Their personnel included Cadet First Lieutenant Ethan Brewer, Cadet Second Lieutenant Lillian Kale, Cadet Senior Airman Leanne Ashley, Cadet Airman Aaliyah Hill, and Cadet Staff Sergeant Jaden Brooks. 
honoring America tonight with the singing of our national anthem were members of the W.R. Odell Elementary School's Roaring Dragon Chorus. Mr. McCarthy will announce their personnel. Students, just give a wave when your name is read. We have Emberlyn Johnson, Catherine Loki, Eloise Preston, Kate Berry, Mahi Shah, Tanusha Pandey, Anvi Tete, Zaina Syed, Anvi Chaturveri, Shani Gatinji, Dalton Drum, Amina Johnson, Austin Walker, Pranavi Sivakumar, Christiane Stennis, Olivia Correa, Mia Moberg, Emmeline Gable, Aria Bowen, Isabel Turner, Evie Kreitzer, Paige Wonderland, Lauren Davies, Elizabeth Utecht, Zuri Johnson, Kanmani Karunakaran, Mila Fu, Sanvi Arya Santi, Joshita Dinesh Babu, Maya Addis, Swamini Garul, Ava Richardson, Srinidhi Nutaki, Vachan Cheni, Constantina Smaliaros, Divina Mungi, Melba Marquez Pala, Evelyn Newton, Elisa Billing, Harper Clemency, Blake Odenbaku, Melania Corrales, Anwita Chaudhary, Megan Bra, Peyton Miners, Amog Chowan, Kylie Pignatiello, Prophecy Lease, Jalia Hall, Kai Ponchanamaroon, Ashna Tandon, Emberlyn Johnson, and Catherine Loki. The Roaring Dragon Chorus. Board members, we will move to 3.01 to adopt the agenda. I need a motion to approve the agenda for the November 6, 2023 work and business session as presented. So move. I need a second. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Mr. Floyd. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The agenda is approved as presented. We'll move to 4.01, our impact through education awards. We'll have Mr. Phil Furr to the podium. Welcome, Mr. Furr. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Kapicki, good evening. Tonight, we will present Impact Through Education Awards to students and staff at R. Brown McAllister STEM Elementary School and Concord High School. Our sponsors for the Impact Awards are our friends at Equitable. Before we get started with the awards, We'd like to offer our sincere thanks and gratitude to Equitable for its continued sponsorship of the Impact Through Education Awards. Tonight, we continue our 14th year of honoring those making an impact in our schools with this award. We appreciate your support and thank you for helping us celebrate and recognize deserving students and staff. We also want to say a word of thanks to our Cabarrus Regional Chamber and to Concord Trophy Center for providing us with the awards plaques each month. Now, on to tonight's awards. May I have the R. Brown McAllister STEM Elementary School Administrative Team come forward, please. Our first honoree from R. Brown McAllister STEM Elementary is Oscar Castillo. Oscar, please come forward with your family. Oscar is a hardworking student with a joyful personality. He is eager to learn and grow and consistently puts forth his best efforts, often encouraging others along the way. Oscar's current and previous teachers share that he is always friendly, hardworking, and encouraging to other students. He has shown positivity throughout his time at R. Brown McAllister STEM. He always has a smile on his face and is eager to learn. 
since hopping out of the car with purpose and presence as a kindergartner and continuing through to his current fourth grade year, Oscar has been an effervescent and inspiring bobcat. His expressions and words are always uplifting and his heart for others always evident. Truly, Oscar is a great example of perseverance, flexibility, and optimism that we are grateful to have at R. Brown McAllister STEM Elementary. Congratulations, Oscar. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for R. Brown McAllister STEM Elementary School. Our next honoree from R. Brown McAllister is Aaron Lassiter. Aaron, please come forward with your family. Aaron is a hardworking student who always is trying her best on every task she is given. She perseveres even when assignments are hard and always shows up for extra help when it is offered. She loves to write notes, make sketches, and utilize other creative avenues to express her knowledge or share her inquisitive nature. She is an amazing person and somehow knows when others need a boost, whether a hug for adults on car line or a kind affirmation card. Erin's teachers comment that her positive attitude makes her a joy to teach. One teacher shared, I told Erin that she should 100% run for Congress. And when she announces her candidacy, I would quit my job and help her campaign. <laughs> That's how much faith I have that Aaron will make a great leader one day that will positively impact the world. Another shared, Aaron is a very innovative and creative person who clearly enjoys solving problems in different ways using her creativity to develop new ideas. She comes to school with a willingness and eagerness to learn each day despite if she's having a bad day. Her desire to learn and grow really means a lot to me as her science teacher. Erin has a friendly, positive, and kind attitude toward her peers, and she shows respect for me and her peers. These are all admirable traits to have to be a great future leader. I'm glad to have her in my class. Our MTSS coach and leadership liaison for fifth grade shared, Erin is 20 years younger than I am, but I 100% want to be her when I grow up. <laughs> she possesses an all-around natural pizzazz that can only be imitated but never duplicated. As a student, she is curious, engaged, super skilled, competitive, and ambitious. She loves to lead and encourages others to strive for the same. As a little lady, she has all the qualities in which I can only hope for my own daughter. She creates her own social norms for others find inviting and welcoming to follow. If she ever makes an academic or social mistake, which is very seldom, she is quick to reflect and showcase her humility. Erin's entire presence is a breath of fresh air that I want to inhale every day. She is beautiful inside and out and still wears the crown for the most glamorous school picture of all time. <laughs> Lives will be changed for the absolute best in the hands of Aaron Lasseter. We all agree and are glad that Aaron is an RBM Bobcat. Congratulations, Aaron. You are an Impact Ed Through Education Award winner for R. Brown County.
Also from R. Brown McAllister is support staff member Barbara Glasgow. Ms. Glasgow, please come forward with your family. Ms. Glasgow works hard to make an impact on the students she serves daily. She takes time to truly get to know the students she serves. Ms. Glasgow helps in celebrating student accomplishments and creates a positive atmosphere in the cafeteria. Though she has limited time to interact with students, Ms. Glasgow finds ways of making students feel seen and appreciated every day. She is truly an asset to the Bobcat family and is making a positive impact on the school and community. Ms. Glasgow is willing to help any student or staff member whether it's one-on-one -on -one or an entire line of students, the students always feel important, and Ms. Glasgow's caring demeanor makes children feel at ease. She's reliable, respectful, and responsible. According to the teachers and staff at R. Brown McAllister, Ms. Glasgow is very flexible and always does what is best for students. Over the years, she has helped tackle many projects, whether handing out food to cars during the COVID pandemic, sorting out ID cards for students, cleaning up spilled milk, loading lunches for field trips, pushing a cart through the building to serve in-class lunches, or working with children to practice conservation and kindness. She has a smile on her face and enthusiasm in her voice. Ms. Glasgow is very connected to Cabarrus County. She regularly supports her own children and grandchildren who attended RBM STEM and is an advocate for all. It is clear Ms. Glasgow is an integral part of the R. Brown McAllister family. Congratulations, Barbara. You are an Impact Through Education Award winner for R. Brown McAllister STEM. And finally, from R. Brown McAllister is teacher Ashlyn Edwards. Ms. Edwards, please come forward with your family. Ms. Edwards graduated from A.L. Brown High School and the University of North Carolina Charlotte and began working in CCS in 1994 at Odell Elementary School. She has taught various grade levels and subjects at several schools including Odell, Weddington Hills, and R. Brown McAllister Elementary. Ms. Edwards came to R. Brown in 2002 where she has been a teacher in fifth and second grades for the past 21 years. Several of her colleagues nominated Ms. Edwards sharing high praise and accolades including Ashlyn has dedicated her career to making a difference in the lives of the children she teaches. She holds her students to high standards because she knows they are capable. She pushes them to reach goals, supports them through their learning, and loves them for themselves. Ashlyn is their greatest advocate and will move mountains, if necessary, to do what is best for her kids. She leaves a legacy of hundreds of children who have been impacted by her teaching. Their lives are all better because of the difference she has made. Ashlyn has been my mentor, whether official or not, for the past three years. After beginning teaching in the midst of the pandemic, I moved grade levels my second year teaching in 2021, and everything was new. Ashlyn immediately took me under her wing, and I knew that as long as I followed her lead, I'd survive. And I cannot thank her enough for the extra work she took on to be my mentor. Ashlyn treats every student in the whole grade level like one of her own students and is a fierce advocate for all, academically and otherwise. She is a hard worker and the most organized person I know. I learned that even after 30 years of teaching, she still rereads her lesson plans each night before school to ensure that she knows exactly how she's going to teach it and so that she can deliver the best possible lesson for her students. She has truly made such a positive impact on not just her students, but the entire community around her. I am lucky enough to call Ashlyn a co-worker, a friend, and most importantly, my school mom. Many could probably call her the same at some point. Parents consistently affirm Ms. Edwards' efforts. One commented, Ms. Edwards has ignited a love of learning with my son. 
In the past, he has been a reluctant reader, and he is enjoying reading chapter books in his reading group. She's also introduced him to a fun math game that he begs to play at home. Not only is Ms. Edwards a skilled educator in the classroom, she has helped keep the learning going at home as well. Ms. Edwards is an amazing asset to the Bobcat family. Congratulations, Ashlyn. You are an Impact Through Education Award winner for R. Brown McAllister. We will now continue with our November Impact Through Education Awards by welcoming Concord High School. May I have the Concord High Administrative Team come forward, please. Our first honoree from Concord High School is Heidi Arianis Figueroa. Heidi, please come forward with your family. Heidi has made a positive impact on our school community. Heidi's leadership skills are exemplary. She has repeatedly demonstrated her ability to take charge and inspire her peers. Whether it, is being, whether it be organizing school events or leading group projects, Heidi possesses a natural gift for rallying others towards a common goal. Her confidence, coupled with her exceptional communication skills, enables her to effectively collaborate with her classmates and navigate through challenges with ease. CHS is a better place because of Heidi's commitment to fighting against corruption in our society. She has consistently shown a strong sense of justice and a willingness to speak up against wrongdoing. Heidi's dedication to making a difference is truly inspiring and it has had a profound impact on our school community. Students look up to her as a role model and are motivated to follow her lead in standing up against injustice. Moreover, Heidi's kindness and humor have brightened the atmosphere in our school. Her infectious laughter and positive attitude create a welcoming environment where everyone feels comfortable and valued. Heidi's genuine interest in others and her willingness to lend a helping hand has earned her the respect and admiration of both students and teachers alike. Due to all these reasons and more, Heidi was selected as one of CHS's Impact Through Education Award winners. Congratulations, Heidi. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Concord High School. Our next honoree from Concord is Sarah Weaver. Sarah, please come forward with your family. Sarah Weaver represents everything it means to be a Concord Spider. She is always looking for new ways to learn while also taking the time to help her peers. She is respected by students and staff alike. Sarah is kind, caring, knowledgeable, and an integral part of our school's culture. Sarah is a student of integrity. She's always in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. She does not let obstacles or challenges prevent her from doing her best or what is right. She asks questions and ensures that she has a deep understanding of the content or skills being covered. We are proud of her willingness to work with anyone and how she is a positive and energetic 
spot first thing in the mornings through late in the after school activities. Sarah has made an impact on many students' lives through her time as a student athletic trainer. She has used this platform to help take care of our student athletes, specifically football players on and off the field. On the field, she exhibits a servant heart by helping our athletes through stretching, taping, and providing first aid. Off the field, she helps our players during study hall by tutoring them so that they can be successful in the classroom too. Sarah is loyal and kind. When she commits to doing something, whether it's in the classroom, at work as a lifeguard, in athletics at CHS as a swimmer or student athletic trainer, or in her cycling club, she gives 110% to what she's doing and does it with a humble pride. Sarah often puts others before herself. She wants to see all people succeed. She is always willing to put others ahead of herself and help them be successful both in and out of the classroom. Due to all these reasons and more, Sarah has been selected as one of CHS's Impact Through Education Award winners. Congratulations, Sarah. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner. Next from Concord High is staff member Tony Lomatire. Mr. Lomatire, please come forward with your family. Mr. Lomatire is Concord High's head custodian. Tony always makes himself available no matter when you call or how big or small the task may be. He is positive, professional, and effective in all his duties. Tony is Mr. On the Spot. If a teacher emails or calls him, he will be on the scene in minutes and works assiduously to get it fixed in a timely manner. He is always pleasant, positive, and kind. According to one CHS staff member, he is the living embodiment of the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> Other than his fandom of the New England Patriots, nobody at CHS will ever have anything negative to say about Tony. <laughs> Tony makes CHS a better place to work and learn every day by maintaining a safe and clean school and providing service with a smile. Congratulations, Tony. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Concord High School. Finally from Concord is teacher Lauren Petty. Ms. Petty, please come forward with your family. Ms. Lauren Petty is Concord High's MTSS coach and so much more. She constantly advocates for all students through directly helping students and also providing support to staff. She believes students can succeed and put support in place to ensure their success. She leads the CHS MTSS team of teachers, counselors, and support staff with passion and compassion. She is open-minded. She is never too busy to find time to listen to an idea, suggestion, or a recommendation to help augment homeroom advisory lessons. She is an advocate for students. Once students with exceptional academic potential are identified, she is always delighted to help them explore options and opportunities to promote their growth and development. She is detail-oriented with excellent time management skills. Staff members are in awe of how well she juggles multiple responsibilities, all with a smile. 
Throughout this pan the pandemic and since, there is no doubt that more students were successful and graduated from CHS due to her efforts. Concord High School and our community is a better place due to the impact Ms. Petty has made for all. CHS is lucky to have her. Congratulations, Lauren. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Concord High School. This concludes our Impact Awards presentations for tonight. Congratulations to all our recipients, and thanks again to our partners, Equitable and the Cabarrus Chamber of Commerce, for your partnership. Thank you, Mr. Fur. Board members will move to 4.02 with our Hillbush Ford Teacher of the Month with Dr. Michael Williams. Welcome, Dr. Williams. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Kopicki, and to our viewing audiences, both here and watching the live stream. It is my pleasure to recognize our Hillbish Ford Teacher of the Month for November. We always want to begin by expressing our sincere thanks and gratitude to Mr. Tim Vaughn and Hillbish Ford for their tremendous generosity and continued sponsorship of this wonderful recognition program. Our Hillbish Ford Teacher of the Month for November is Leah Pfeiffer, a band teacher at Harris Road Middle School. At this time, I'd like to invite Ms. Pfeiffer, her family, and the Harris Road Middle School administrative team in attendance to please come forward. Tonight, I would like to share the nomination that was submitted by a former student about Ms. Piper. Student wrote, although I only had Ms. Piper for two years, I have not been so impacted by a teacher in my entire student career. There's not much more to say. She was one of the most supportive teachers I've ever had and created a community instead of a class. She deserves this special honor because there are hundreds of students out there that feel the same. She has truly made a difference in my life and so many others. Ms. Piper, thank you for the impact you have uh, made to teach, engage, and inspire students in your classroom. Congratulations on your selection as Cabarrus County Schools Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month. We will move to 4.03 with our Everyday Hero Award winner with Dr. Jonathan Bowers and Mr. Andrew Campbell. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Kapicki. Uh, if I could get Mr. Campbell, Mr. Taylor, and uh, Mr. Young and any of his special guests to join us down front. If
It is certainly my pleasure to stand before you tonight once again and introduce this month's Everyday Hero Award recipient. As you know, this award is presented to an exceptional employee within our Auxiliary Services Division, and this includes our Kids Plus, Facilities and Maintenance, Construction, School Nutrition, and Transportation Divisions. Sponsored by Great Wolf Lodge, the Everyday Hero Award is intended to acknowledge the outstanding, behind the scenes, and sometimes often unnoticed work of our Auxiliary Services professionals. We all know there's great work being done by these employees every day, and that should be recognized publicly. Nominations for this award are submitted by Cabarrus County Schools employees, students, and parents. And one recipient is selected to be recognized each month. This month's recipient of the Everyday Hero Award is Mr. Randy Young, custodian at Northwest Cabarrus High School. Joining me here tonight to help present this award are Mr. Chuck Taylor, Director of Facilities and Maintenance, and Mr. Andy Campbell, our Custodial Services Manager for Cabarrus County Schools. I'm now going to turn it over to Mr. Campbell so he can share with you why Mr. Young is so deserving of this award. Thank you. Mr. Randy Young joined the uh, CCS family back in 2003 at Northwest High School. That's over 20 years of dedicated service to a lot of graduates. A lot of faces got to see Mr. Young day in and day out. He has been extremely dedicated over those 20 years and he maintains a very, very clean area. And their last inspection this past year, the school received 100, and he plays a very vital part of that as well. Um, most everyone I've ever spoke to speaks very highly of Mr. Young. They say everyone says he has a great heart, very kind-hearted, good-hearted fellow. Everyone notices him every day. He comes to work every day with a smile and a positive attitude. He makes everyone around him better, students and staff. So, and he's been called upon many times to go help at other schools to get them caught up as well. He's done it every single time. It is a pleasure to watch Mr. Young with his passion and the skill in his craft that, he's, that he is. So, it is with great honor that he uh, announced that he is the everyday hero for us. Okay, board members will move to 4.04 .04, W.R. Odell Elementary National Blue Ribbon School with Dr. John Kapicki. Thank you, Mrs. Adcock. At this time, I would ask our principal, Mrs. Lisa Ober and Dr. Sandy Ward to come to the podium, please. So I think it's very appropriate that we started out this evening with the excellence of the students singing the national anthem this, this evening. So thank you very much. And and you certainly, without question, were loud and proud. So thank you again for being here this evening. You sounded great. Um, that's a tough tune to carry out, and you did it with, with fine fashion. Um, the National Blue Ribbon Award is a big deal. Um, and and our, our school at WR Elementary has accomplished this feat. I'd say probably about maybe 16, 17 months ago we started this Dr. Ward and uh, began with the conversation, doing some homework and, and digging to start to promote some of the greatness that's taking place here in Cabrera's County under our, our, our wonderful teachers and our, and our administrators. Um, 
So we pursued this award because it is a big deal and we believe that we have many schools in the Cabarrus County school system that should be acknowledged as Blue Ribbon schools. It is a national award. It's an exemplary award for exemplary high performing national Blue Ribbon schools across the country in the United States. There were nine designations in the state of North Carolina this year. There were 353 across the nation. Um, and we were, again, one of, one of those schools in the state of North Carolina to receive it. Um, Lisa Ober did not miss a beat, picked up the mantle when Dr. Ward joined us at the county office in a new role, expanding her leadership abilities and skills. And they continued to work together along with their faculty or who were this evening, who I commend and say to you, thank you very much for your dedication to our, te to our, to our students and our community, because without you, none of this happens. Um, your excellence. I have been in your school uh, several times, and I, about a month or so ago, I think I was there, I think Mr. Floyd was there with me when I was going through the building, and uh, it's impressive. Uh, you do not miss a beat. I don't even think you acknowledge me when I walk into your classrooms, which is kind of cool, um, but your, your uh, instruction and, and how you, you engage with children is extraordinary, and I really appreciate your dedication to our our, our children, our community, and what you do there at Odell Elementary, because you certainly deserve and you know, the reason or the why behind this award. Um, so again, uh, we are now a recipient of a National Blue Ribbon School in the Cabarrus County School System. You will always have the claim that you were first, uh, but I do anticipate that there will be many others. And with that, I would ask Dr. Ward and, and Mrs. Lisa Ober to, to comment on this award. So thank you. All right, thank you, Madam Chairperson. Distinguished board members and Dr. Kapicki for recognizing Odell Elementary as a 2023 Blue Ribbon School for exemplary high performance. I'm grateful to Dr. Kapicki and this board for the privilege to lead the school and to follow in the footsteps of Dr. Ward, who was both principal at the time of nomination and the leader who opened Odell Elementary and established a culture of excellence and high expectations that brings this honor tonight. I'd like to recognize the leadership and the staff of our sister school at Odell Primary. I was lucky enough to work there, and I saw Dr. Health and his staff work tirelessly to build relationships and install a love of learning and students that brought them to our successful halls. I'd like to thank our APs, Ms. Austin and Ms. Orlando, for their passion, commitment, talent, and the consistency they've provided to our staff during transitions between leaders. Of course, I have to thank our amazing students and the supportive Odell community. <laughs> that community prior prior prioritizes education and the development of well-rounded learners. Finally, last, but the very opposite of least, I want to thank our teachers and our staff. Blue Ribbon Core tenants include celebration of diversity, innovative teaching, and high standards, and that defines the staff at Odell. They believe that every child can be successful. They believe in each other and their ability to grow kids. They believe that our diversity is a strength, and they believe that inclusivity and excellence can only be found in the very best public schools. I appreciate you for having us here tonight. Tonight is just the start of some celebrations, and pretty soon we will be inviting you to our campus to have um, some celebrations with us. So. so how do I follow someone who has cards, no cards? <laughs> Well, I'll just say this, um, opening Odell is probably the pinnacle of my career and just having the opportunity and Dr. Louder for trusting me to open that school, um, just an absolute honor. Um, we brought together eight different schools, teachers from all over the place, kids from four or five different schools and we made it a cohesive family um, that believes in the power of community and diversity. And so to my Odell family, I just say thank you for coming out this evening. Um, you know that you'll always be in my heart. And to my staff, I've hired most of you. Some of you have come over from Odell, but you guys, 
there are really no words for you because you saw my vision and you ran away with it. And so as I leave Odell, I leave on the highest of notes, and I know that you guys will continue to soar like we always do. To Anna and Emily, the two girls that I hired to come in and fill that void without you girls, let me just tell you, you will not find any better assistant principals in this district. You are everything, and just know that. So thank you to Odell and to everyone. Okay, we will move to 5.01 and the approval of minutes. I need a motion to approve the open session minutes as presented for October the 2nd and October 9th. Madam Chair, minor, minor change or minor correction. On page 3 of the uh, October 9th minutes, there's an extra S in my name. Extra S in my spelling of my name. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes with that change. I need a second. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Mr. Walter. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The minutes are approved with the change. We will move to 6.01 with board chair comments. I just wanted to tell everyone that the Board of Education will attend the North Carolina School Board Association's annual conference this uh, next week in Greensboro. And we will hold a special call meeting on November 20th, and this meeting is for board member professional development. I would like to just mention that me and Ms. Sandage attended the North Carolina School Board Association Law Conference in Asheville, North Carolina earlier in October and brought back a lot of information that we've shared about the legal environment of schools, schools and school boards. We will move to 6.02 with superintendent comments. Dr. John Kapiki. Thank you. So as we discussed earlier in this year that we were going to be highlighting some of our key uh, personnel, we are going to begin to do, begin this recognition this evening um, as we um, honor, continue to honor our folks. Um, each month we have an onward video series that shares the stories that inspire, uplift, and remind us why education is not just a profession but a lifelong calling that transcends the classroom and builds relationships in our school communities that continue well after the school days are over. We invite you to join us in discovering these incredible individuals who bring the magic of education to life in the Cabarrus County Schools. The remarkable stories, the unsung heroes, the everyday champions, and those in our educational community who are leaving a lasting impact on future generations. You're the first person they see in the morning, so you got to put a, a, a good impression. You know, there are children with feelings and things like that, and then you got to give them that, whatever it is they're missing in the morning, you got to give it to them. Hey, one name to Corp Virgil. Uh, very dependable. That's two. Uh, dependable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Virgil Powell. I retired from the Army in 20, 2011 with the Concord in 2012. And I was going to sit down and not do anything for the rest of my life. My daughter was at early college, so I would take her to school in the morning just to get out of the house and hang out a little bit. So when I pulled up to drop her off, I would see these buses. It's one driver on the Pittsburgh Steelers had, so we started talking football. And in this conversation, all right, man, come on. But anyone like, come on, be a bus driver, come on, be a bus driver. I said, no, nah, man, I'm not doing that. I've been for 30 years, I'm not doing that, man. So between that and me, my wife getting tired of me being in the house, not doing nothing, and uh, being on her nerves pretty much, I decided to become a bus driver in 2014. Ninth year, I'm over here at Norway's Cabarrus. So I see that a lot, you know, and then see my kids from, Elementary going to middle school now. I see that a lot this year. You just see kids in middle school going to high school. And then, you know, I got some heartbreaking news yesterday. One of my favorite kids from elementary is moving to Clayton this weekend. You know, her sister's a freshman here and he rode with our buses, you know. So I had something to move down to Stanley County, man, and they were crying and carrying on. You know, so it kind of that connection with kids, man. So, you know, when we were kids, 
somebody care for us as bus drivers, custodial workers. We all in the same community. Everybody knew each other. We had a church together. Cafeteria workers, teachers, everybody knew each other pretty much. You kind of, you know, it's instilled in you to do that. I discovered a note from a t from the school for a middle school kid. So that so-and-so was taking stuff from the cafeteria or what. I said, child's hungry. He ain't doing it because he's hungry. So I, I was put him to the side and man, you're good. You're good. I'll give him five bucks. You know, things like that, man. He's, he's, you know, you look at a kid and tell what the home life is and what they're going through. It's body language. Body language. Okay, this bus is for my kids that ride my bus at their little brothers or sisters. And I'm giving away like two this year. And uh, one of the little girl that goes to Weddington Hills, she came and said, my brother loves that bus. He plays with it all the time. And at first he was like kind of, you know, shy to me and wouldn't wave at the car. Once I gave him this bus, man, he's like my best buddy, always waving. And I gave him uh, a few away last summer to a uh, young lady that has a cousin. She works in nutrition. You know, I come out and wave to the bus. I stopped giving to him, man. So I guess one day they'll be on the bus, you know, if I'm here, you know. My wife said I, I spent too much money on school buses and you know, big cheese. Call, keep calling my bus the big cheese. He ain't leaving that job. He ain't leaving the big cheese. So again, I thank Phil Fur and his department for reaching out to some of the special employees here in the Cabarrus County school system that define what it is to work with our children every day. It's more than just going into the classrooms. It begins with folks like Virgil every day welcoming our kids on the bus and safely getting them to and from school. So I do appreciate all that, that Mr. Powell is doing on a daily basis and uh, his commitment to our kids is, speaks for itself. So um, I thank Phil and his team for putting that together and I especially Virgil and all the many bus drivers that are out there safely transporting our kids on a daily basis. And on that note, uh, many veterans just like Mr. Powell in the video are employed within Cabarrus County and we'd like to honor and thank them for their service to our country. Um, especially among us, Mr. Floyd, thank you for your service as a veteran. We appreciate your service to our country as well. We want to acknowledge you and all the veterans this Friday, um, Veterans Day, and in that observance, our, sc our schools will be closed this Friday, observing Veterans Day. And uh, today I had the privilege to go out to visit J.M. Robinson High School where the U.S. Navy Office of Outreach and Diversity was on hand with a virtual reality simulator called the Nimitz, which allowed our students to discover opportunities in the Navy after high school. Uh, it, was, it was quite an experience. Uh, they had a, a real live demonstration. Um, it's, it's escaping right now, but you put it on your head. Virtual reality, virtual reality yeah. I'm, I'm in reality right now. Um, <laughs> But it was it was something to see the things they can they, that 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 our that our students um, can engage in. And the big takeaway for me, and I think our kids, is all of the opportunities that exist in the armed forces for our kids that are there um, upon graduating high school. There are so many different things that they can get themselves involved in, and it's such an honorable career to pursue. Uh, we certainly encourage our kids, and we welcome any of those opportunities for them to come and visit our campus. I'd like to thank Dr. Carla Holt, the Career Development Coordinator at J.M. Robinson, for her work in arranging the Navy to visit Cabarrus County, which um, I was told today it's the only North Carolina stop for this year's tour. So great job, Dr. Carla Holt, for that. Um, our realignment continues um, as we continue to plan and proceed and look at the evidence and the data to make good informed decisions for our board as we get prepared to make our recommendations as we gather our community together over the next couple of months to seek more information. We will have community meetings held November 28th and 29th to inform the community about the long range district realignment study. These meetings will occur at four high school sites over the next over those two days. On Tuesday November 28th at 5 p.m. we will be at Concord High School followed by a 7.30 session at J.M. Robinson High School. And then on Wednesday, November 29th, we will be at Cox Mill High School, where we will host a 5 o'clock meeting, followed by a 7.30 meeting at Hickory Ridge High School. The public will hear a presentation on the realignment process and have a chance to view boundary options in a rotation format in the school's comments area. The public can provide comments on each boundary option through an online survey link provided by Cooperative Strategies. Those comments will then be shared with the Board of Education. For more information on the community meetings and the realignment process, please visit our realignment website at www.nc.gov.
engagewithccs.com. And then lastly, I'd like to congratulate Mount Pleasant High School's marching band. They had their final competition performance this season at North Davidson High School, and they cleaned up uh, at, at that competition. Their list, of, their list of awards they received were first place drum major, first place color guard, first place percussion, first place marching and maneuvering, first place general effect, first place music, first place overall in class 2A, and the overall grand champion in 1A, 2A, 3A, 4, and 5A. So to Mount Pleasant High School, congratulations. Also today we were informed by Mr. Bart Tolbert that two CCS music educators were recognized for outstanding teaching at the annual North Carolina Music Education Association in services. Nick Carl from Hickory Ridge Middle School and Greg Dills from J.M. Robinson High School both received the Edward Q. Rooker Encore Award given by the North Carolina chapter of the American School Band Directors Association. The Rooker Award is given to band directors with, with less than seven years of classroom teaching experience but have made a considerable impact not only on their students but on music education in North Carolina. Both were nominated by colleagues. Nick was nominated by this award by Ms. Tracy Humphrey, Director of Bands at Forest Hills High School in Union County, and Greg was nominated by Mr. Andrew Kraft, Director of Fine Arts Education for Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools. I share that with you to say to you that their colleagues across the state are recognizing the excellence that these two gentlemen are exhibiting here with our kids, and we're very fortunate to have them. So congratulations to Nick Carr from Hickory Ridge Middle School and Greg Dills from J.M. Robinson for the incredible recognition and honor. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Picky. We'll move to 6.03 with our board attorney comments with Mr. Gil Middlebrooks. Thank you, Ms. Adcock. Later tonight in closed session, board members will be taking up matters related to your grievance policies. And in preparing for that, we uncovered some ways in that we think your processes can be uh, streamlined. And Ms. Adcock and Dr. Kapicki have asked us to work through the policy committee to make recommendations. And in the coming weeks, we will be doing that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to 7.01 with committee reports. And I know Ms. Lindsay has a report she'd like to give to the board. So I had a wonderful opportunity to participate in the HOSA regional um, competition at Cox Mill on October the 28th. Um, I was absolutely blown away by the work that these children are doing. Um, so I just got information from Angie Stegall. Um, she is the health science instructor and the Southwest Regional HOSA representative and advisor that we have 160 kids that are going to the state championships um, from Cox Mill. Um, I, was, I had an opportunity to judge the prepared speeches. Um, that these these kids did, and um, their topic was about creating change, and um, that was all that they were given was that as the topic. It was unbelievable to see um, just the t how they took that, whether it be from um, you know opportunities from where that they they grew up, if they didn't grow up here in America, and going back to their home countries of India, um, creating opportunities there for those children, and then bringing that experience back to America, versus um, all kinds of different things, whether it be uh, things that they've had to experience through their parents. Just how they took that five-minute speech, just that little topic, and, and went with it. I mean, some of those kids left me in tears. It was unbelievable to, to listen to them and, and their experiences. So I was so honored and proud to be able to participate in that. Um, and, I, and I do encourage, um, if y'all get the opportunity to do that as well, again, um, there will be more opportunities, uh, she said, for that. So, um, it, it, But it was wonderful, and I, and I truly appreciate it. Well, thank you. Any other board members? Mr. Floyd? Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, want to take a minute to talk about uh, the school visit committee. And uh, first of all, I think there's nothing more important as a board we can be doing than getting in a school building during a school day and seeing what's going on. 
And it's very, very important that we make the time to do that. If we make the time to do other things, that's <clears throat> got to be number one on our list. So I applaud Mr. Treadway and, and you, Ms. Chair, for setting that up and for organizing those visits, and they've been good. And I thought about something that ties very well into redistricting that's coming up, and I shared this with you and you asked me to share it with everybody. I thought this maybe this would be the time. <clears throat> During our visit to Concord High School, I noticed something, and I thought about it after we left. So the football stadium there is named Robert C. Bailey Stadium. Dr. Bailey is a long time, beloved team doctor football team. His great granddaughter, Leah, was in the English class that we poked our head into. She's a fourth generation Concord spider. Her grandparents met there. We toured Charles Reimer Gymnasium. Charlie Reimer's granddaughter is one of my classmates. Her grandson was one of my students at Concord. Chrissy Rotan, the assistant principal that walked around with us, she's a third generation spider, and her kids just graduated fourth generation spiders. I met my wife there. I couldn't believe how many people who I went to high school with whose kids were walking around there. It's kind of distressing, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but my point is a school like that is very full of rich tradition, generational legacy, and it's really important to people around here, including me, but a lot of people. And many of our names are on the walls of that building, as well as our parents' and grandparents' names, and we have other schools like that in our district. And a school that's 130 years old, has obviously seen and endured a lot of a lot of things and a lot of change for better or for worse multiple relocations a fire integration exponential growth and now wars and now plagues and so on but it has endured it will endure it will grow it'll welcome new folks into its walls near and far and it'll continue to be a pillar of this community that we serve each change it went through may have been uncomfortable even unfathomable at the time but each one led to it being the incredible place that I got to be a part of and one that my kids will be a part of. And our school system as a whole is just like that. It's the same way. And it is our charge to get those changes right while, without turning our backs on our history. But we have to get those changes right. And we have to do it even if it's the hard thing to do. So as we head into redistricting, that is really good perspective to take with us. This thing that we're responsible for, the entire district, is so much bigger than just us and just right now. It's bigger than just getting our own kids through school the way we want it for the next five years. It'll be the biggest thing this school system's done in 40 years, at least. And it'll echo beyond the years that our kids are there. The district currently serves about 35,000 children, not just the ones I know. And we can't even put a number on how many it's going to serve. In the future, we'll be affected by the decisions that we make now. So this visit was a good reminder to me that we have to get this right, not the way that I want it right now but right, not 90% right, all or nothing. Not just the easy way, we gotta go the distance, even if it's inconvenient to get it right. The stakes are really, really high, and we cannot afford to get it wrong. Some of these decisions are gonna be hard, some are gonna go against everything that I might even want, but leadership isn't about doing what we personally want, it's about having the courage to do what we have to do, and I just thought that was a great epiphany when I walked out of that school that hit me personally and I think applies to all of us in our whole district and I wanted to share that with the board and tell you this my honor to do this work with you and I appreciate everybody on this board and I appreciate the staff and I appreciate the uh, cooperative strategies and everybody who's putting unbelievable unbelievable amount of work into this uh, but I hope everyone out there understands how seriously we take this and how seriously how serious it is so thank you sorry for the long-winded Committee report that's not even my committee. Uh, <clears throat> and nothing on athletics. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Floyd. Anybody else have any reports? Okay. Well, we will move to 8.01 and our audit report, financial physical year ending June 30th with Mr. Philip Penn. Welcome. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members. I'm a little crestfallen. I thought the big crowd was coming out to talk about audited financials. <laughs> um, right, exactly. Uh, with me tonight, Adam Sheparek from Anderson, Wilth, Anderson Smith and Wyke? Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay. So in, in your board package tonight, you, you received three different documents or a few days ago when the agenda went out. Uh, the very large document is actually our audited financial results for the year ended June 30th, 2023. That was filed on time with the state on, on October 31st. It was our Halloween present to them. Uh, they appreciated us doing that on time. 
Um, that becomes the background of what's called the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report, better known as the ACFR, that we'll be issuing at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, but that's basically the guts of the ACFR. Uh, and we put some things that become a, a wrapper around that to make it a little more complete of a financial discussion almost of what the financial condition of the district is. Uh, you're also going to find in there a, a required communication letter from the audit firm that outlines the manner in which they conducted the audit, uh, the limitations of doing the audit, and any significant findings that they had in the audit. And then the last one uh, is a summary board presentation that I'm going to let him go through, at which point I will sit down and come back up and answer, help him answer any questions you may have. Uh, it's about 60 or 70 slides long, so it shouldn't take more than an hour, an hour and a half, I think, right? So yeah. You get three course credits for it. There you go. <laughs> All right. Terrific. All right. And we're ready to go, and I believe it's the, it's the right button there. All right. Thank you. Good luck. We're all counting on you. Get, get used to it. The crowd always leaves. <clears throat> so again, uh, we're going to go over a, a brief summary. So found within those 80 pages is all the required information. Uh, governmental accounting standards boards, they, they issue uh, standards by which disclosures are presented. Uh, accounting is um, applied. And within that information is <clears throat> some key data that I think is most important to you. Um, in, within those financial statements, you will see disclosures about the net position of the school system. Uh, that's all well and good, but <clears throat> you can't borrow on the value of your assets. There are liabilities that are actually state liabilities that are portioned out to each school system based on the number of retirees out of this school system. And really, uh, what I think management and the board should focus on is, is more of discussions of fund balance. And that is also woven in within these statements. But the data I've pulled out is really centered around that fund balance numbers. That is the, um, that is the finances available for appropriating in your budget. It's the cash on hand available to be spent on child nutrition. Uh, it really, again, is to me the most important uh, uh, pieces uh, within these documents. So to start, we've got a couple of charts uh, just to show you uh, some, some key data points. Again, uh, cash on hand. We are t uh, these first few sl slides are uh, information on your general fund, your local fund, as well as an other special revenue fund, uh, maybe uh, known as Fund 8. It was created uh, 10, 12 years ago separated out from the local fund. The local funds now really house mostly just county funds. And then any other uh, miscellaneous state and federal dollars and also some tuition and fees, uh, indirect costs that you charge to federal programs, that runs through Fund 8. But those really combined make up your local available fund balance. Uh, the majority of your funding comes from the state and also a smaller portion comes from the federal government. Those funds do not carry fund balance. Those funds are use or lose it. You spend it. You really almost uh, initiate the expenditure, write the check, and then get reimbursed from the state all in the same day. So again, you don't carry cash in those accounts. You don't carry fund balance. What's really available is in those, uh, those two local funds. And you can see cash on hand. Uh, a little over $15 million, $17 million. It looks like a significant decrease, but again, uh, cash isn't as important to me as fund balance. Cash can be manipulated just by uh, when you pay your payables. There's a significant number of payables uh, that are made right at year end for retirement, uh, your FICA payments, and just by the timing of those payments can affect cash balances. Same thing with receivables. You actually have some large receivables uh, due at year end that you received after year end. And so cash, again, fluctuates with uh, timing much different than fund balance, which with, with fund balances, which is really the amount of funds available. So um, you actually, even though cash went down uh, $8 million, you only spent $2.5 million of fund balance. So the rest of that is, is really timing of receivables and uh, payables. Your receivables um, went up $2.5 million, again, timing on payments for, like for FICA, hospitalization, retirement. And then you had AP that was $4 million less than last year. So you just paid bills sooner, right before June 30th, rather than right after. So again, all of that affects uh, cash. Whereas 
fund balance is really the best gauge for your financial health. This chart here shows your fund balance and available for appropriated fund balance. And you can see you have been on a scale of using fund balance the last actually three years. And although the available for appropriations fund balance decreased even more than regular fund balance, that also is results of timing. So North Carolina laws are written to prevent you from spending dollars that you might not have. And that includes accounts receivable. You actually can't appropriate fund balance for receivables until the cash is in the bank. So that automatically, that two and a half million dollars extra receivables reduces the amount of fund balance you can appropriate. You have cash coming in, but it's not in the bank as of June 30, therefore you can't budget for it in the next year. You also have encumbrances outstanding. Uh, this year you had significant encumbrances in both the local fund, general fund, and the other special revenue fund, totaling about $4.4 .4 million. <coughs> encumbrances are just open POs. They're not payables yet. You haven't received the goods, but you plan on buying goods. So again, in order to make sure you don't spend money you don't have, you have to restrict fund balance for any open POs. So again, you still have fund balance of, uh, to spend in the future. You just can't appropriate it in the 23-24 year because of these outstanding purchase orders. So uh, although the available for appropriation did decrease drastically, the dark blue line of total fund balance, that again is really the true gauge of uh, financial health and, and the total fund balance um, on hand. <clears throat> The next slide just shows a comparison of revenues and expenses, and as I uh, said, the last three years you've been on a, a scale of actually using fund balance. You used a little bit this year, not as much as last year. Uh, I think these are planned usages of fund balance. You uh, were actually uh, uh, pretty well funded fund balance wise uh, three, four years ago, and uh, have slowly, again, used that uh, under a uh, plan with you and the county to, to spend down some of that fund balance. So again, no surprises here, uh, but it is uh, you know, a, a chart showing, again, three years of, of fund balance usage. <clears throat> this is the data that makes up the information of those three charts. And so you can see, again, cash on hand, 17.2 million compared to 25.9 million last year. But again, that's offset by a $2.6 million receivable compared to just $153,000 last year. Inventories and prepaids, those re remain pretty consistent. Those are also assets to you, but they are, are not spendable assets. They are not cash. You already purchased those items. They make up a non-spendable portion of that fund balance. Again, decreasing your total fund balance to what is actually available for appropriating. That is just one of the decreases. Again, it's an asset on your books, but it really is not cash in the bank. <clears throat> so you can see the various uh, breakdown of your fund balance right below there. Again, 1.1 million non-spendable, 6.8 million of restricted. This includes the restriction for the $4.4 .4 million of encumbrances and the $2.5 million of receivables outstanding. So again, that's the reason for that large increase. Assigned fund balance is made up of um, items that you have set money aside for. You have several assignments of fund balance, including 500,000 uh, assigned for insurance expenditures because you are self-employed workers' comp, and so you have set aside fund balance in case you have a bad year of workers' comp claims. You have also, you've also de uh, de designated $990,000 of fund balance for uh, retirement payouts. There's a long-standing uh, debate between school systems and the state on uh, what are called spiking payments. Uh, retirees who retire from your system that over the course of their uh, tenure did not pay as much into the retirement system as what they'll pull out and whether that should be a, uh, an expenditure of the district they retire from. Again, lawsuits outstanding on there, but you have put aside $990,000 to designate in case uh, those uh, decisions are not in your favor. And that leaves $1.7 million of unassigned fund balance as of June 30, 2023. A brief comparison of revenues in those two funds, you can see from Cabarrus County, nearly $81 million compared to $76.6 million last year. 
and then other revenues make up 10.9 compared to 14.6 last year. Uh, again, a lot of that change from the 10 million this year to the 14 million is in that other special revenue fund where you have various federal and uh, state programs. You have some one-time federal uh, programs that came through. The emergency connectivity funds went through there last year. So again, that's the result of that uh, decline in revenues. And then your expenditures, 94.5 million compared to 95.8 million. And the net, essentially income, a change in fund balance, 2.5 million compared to 4.6 million usage last year and 3.1 million two years ago. Are there any questions about that information? Again, that is uh, truly the um, where your savings are located within these two these two funds, and, wi and within that really that 12.5 million dollars of total fund balance as of June 30, 20. Miss Sandage. All right, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. So in 20. 21, we had about nine million dollars in fund balance. Uh, uh, 19 million. No, I'm talking oh, about the the, uh, the unassigned. Oh yes, yes, in unassigned. So that means like, and I see this as the rainy day fund. If something happens, then we can use this for that something that happened. Do I understand that correctly? Correct. Okay, we'd worked with the state. I mean, not the state, but the county to spend down some of that fund balance because we had too much. I remember that conversation when that happened. Mm -hmm. And this is where we get down to two million and fifteen. Yes. Right. Yeah. So at this point, we're at the very low uh i mean i'm trying to make this make sense but that's where we're at right now yeah, currently there so if you again thinking about it in household terms some of the fund balance in the restricted and the unassigned will make their way down to the unassigned and be available they're they're almost the money you set aside for the next month's rent and the next month's uh electric bill they will come down into the unassigned but when it True raw numbers, yeah, one one point seven million dollars available for assignment. Again, you have purchase orders outstanding of four million dollars. Again, plans to spend money. That money will be funded by twenty three, twenty four county revenues, but you still have obligated yourself in the form of a purchase order. So, one point seven. That is the bottom line, but again, the, there is access to the funds above that that will trickle down into unassigned as they meet the respective requirement to be released from whether a restriction or assignment to then be spent. So, okay, so now for my question. Yes. So we're a rather large district, yes. and when I, when I first got on the board in 2020, we were told we had a healthy fund balance. Okay. This doesn't look like a healthy fund balance compared to the nine million we had when I first got here. So help me understand why that's okay, or how that's okay, um, or if it's okay. It might not be. So again, this this boils down to the relationship between you and the county, and how they want to fund you, and how they want to manage fund balance. Um, <coughs> Across the state, districts have actually been adding fund balance because of the COVID funds received statewide. If, uh, and your position of actually using fund balance is contrary to a lot of districts. Um, so again, I don't, I, I don't want to say what's enough, how much is too much, but there's definitely a three-year trend of fund balance usage um, that you cannot repeat. Yeah, and the only way to restore fund balance is through a surplus at the end of the year, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the other part that's kind of important to keep in mind. So I look at these numbers and it concerns me, mm -hmm. if, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna be very candid about it, right? Because I, it, what you're probably gonna wind up seeing, and I've got this in the back of my mind, is a line item that speaks to restoration of fund balance, right? Because I don't like being this low. And you, you've actually got a board policy that dictates an 8% reserve and fund balance has to be kept uh, and we can't appropriate anything for use it, uh, b below that below that number right and in fact the board policy goes further and says you can't appropriate anything unless you're above 12 percent so you know we can't really appropriate anything in the current year uh because of what i know about the, what these numbers are telling me to offset any of the other expenses that we have okay and, and it's really and, and to take it down to a, the level i like to, to express an unassigned fund balance is your savings account right and everything else is your checking account Right? And if you pull anything out of your savings account, you put it in your checking account, 
it, it goes away, right? There's not a replenishment of that unless you have a surplus in a future year. Thanks for not making me say all that. I appreciate that. But but I'm still worried, and I don't I don't know that there is a plan. I don't know what we do or you know what we discuss to get us out of this I'm yeah. I'm concerned phase. But I, I'm guessing you maybe have the answers for that. That's, no, that's, that's a big deal from here, right? <laughs> okay. But no, I, I mean, and part of the reason you have a CFO is to help you guide through a lot of these kind of issues, right? Because again, it's working with the county to say what's the appropriate level of fund balance and understanding that there is a you have a requirement that I have to follow in your board policy that states what I have to carry for fund balance going forward, right? So the ability to continue to appropriate fund balance going forward doesn't exist anymore. So do we have what we are required to have in that fund ba yes. balance? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Walter. And my question is very similar to Ms. Sanich, Ms. Sanich on the decreasing of the fund balance and it's not being sustainable uh, continuing to do that and then the policy does uh, say and it's a little vague it says the board will maintain a fund balance of a minimum of one month's operating expenses at eight percent uh, in compliance with the recommendation of the local government commission is that local government commission if they change the recommendation is it still no, eight percent the the local government commission put out a years ago a recommendation for fund balance levels it was really geared towards counties and cities that are taxing authorities uh, and not really directed towards school systems and so your board policy of adhering to that in in, in adopting that as a recommend recommendation from schools uh, is isn't uh, widely used across school systems what is, what is the better use what is the better method I, I, again it, it really boils down to the funding capabilities of the county to fund programs that you want to implement uh, for cash flow purposes on a large district seven percent i think is safe it is a uh, um appropriate to have again one month is just writing checks uh, at the beginning of the month versus the end of the month. You want to have cash flow available for that. Uh, you can see just the, the timing of payables from last year to this year. That's $4 million of payables all at the end of the month versus the beginning uh, of, of, or the end of June 30 rather than the beginning of July 1. Uh, those large swings in cash flows um, take millions of dollars, whether it is $12 million, $19 million, $9 million, uh, 1.6 million again that's where your CFO manages cash flow for you um, but there it there is really no recommendation that is put out by the local government commission for school systems and, and I, I would say I'm a little less concerned from a cash flow perspective than I am about what happens in February that we don't know about today some major expense comes up and all of a sudden we don't have the cash to pay for it. we don't have the fund balance to pay for it. better way to put it and we need to go to the county for a special appropriation to cover it right those are the kind of things that concern me about a low fund balance. Yeah, our policy doesn't define what, what type of fund balance this is. Is it the total fund balance? Is it the unassigned? doesn't say any of that. So that's probably something that should be it cleaned up looked at by the policy yeah. committee. Yeah. And I, you would really, I think, look in those bottom three categories, the restricted, the assigned, and the unassigned, and make a policy incorporating those three. The non-spendable, you can't spend it. That's, that's really not fund balance. Right. That is... That is uh, recognizing fund balance for an asset that you already bought. It's right. for light bulbs and nuts and screws. You can't. Inventory, basically. It's inventory, yes. Yeah. So. Um, so I think any policy around fund balance should incorporate those three combined because it really, those can be, again, manip not manipulated, but they alter with just issuing POs, whether you issue POs on June 9th or July 2nd. So you, don't, you wouldn't want a policy that can be adjusted and manipulated with that kind of action so it really should probably incorporate all three and you keep track of that even obviously on a monthly basis you can provide that to the board yeah because we, we run a balance sheet we can we can provide that information so miss Lindsay I mean it's good it's good to know we're not at the lowest of the low but I do want to kind of remind everybody what we spent that money on um, I mean we put fields for Concord, Mount Pleasant, is that correct? We did those football fields. Um, I mean, it's no secret, and this is not to throw anybody under the bus by any stretch, but we've been underfunded 
with our deferred maintenance for years and and that's come about but I mean, we've learned that through this redistricting so I mean yes we had a healthy fund balance and that is fantastic and you know I think especially after 2008 we were all very nervous about making sure that we had enough money on hand um, to if, if something horrible should happen and we needed to fund that but we also had schools that were falling apart and fields that needed to be maintained for these kids to have a safe place to play. Um, it's, it's put us in a bit of a situation as a school board because we want to make sure more than anything that these kids have, have the facilities that they need to be able to thrive and, and do the things that they need. So I just kind of want to put some perspective on that too about the reasons why we've had to kind of get to this point at this place. Uh, right now. I mean, it's good, obviously, that we're looking at it and we can focus on um, regaining um, that, hopefully, as we move forward, but um, that's just a little bit of the, the history of it, too, so thank you. I definitely think there's a perspective to look at when you when you say $20 million, it sounds like a lot, but not when there is a $400 million budget running through your books. Now, again, a lot of that is state money, federal money, but $20 million on, out of 400 million, uh, when the lowest cost of a school is 40 million dollars, 20 million doesn't sound as big as when you say it by itself. Ms. Escobar, thank you. I think you might have answered this question, but I just wanted to clarify. So, in on this slide, you said we have 12.5 million, but in the report on page seven, it says. Uh, our fund balance is 8.9 million. So that difference of 4 million, is that what you're explaining from the difference of June 30th from July 1st? That so that is the, the general fund column that you're looking at as well as the other special revenue. Those two funds combined are, so it's the uh, 8.9 million and the 3.5 million that is in the other special revenue fund. Those are your two local funds. So we're we're talking about fund balance of two funds combined, your right. local sources. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that 8.9 is one of the funds. That's right. That's, okay. the, that's the main fund. That's your general fund. That's where your county revenues come in. Uh, that fund revenues were $84 million, and in the other special revenue fund, you collected $7.5 million. Again, that's made up of... Uh, Everything else, basically. Uh, yeah, NC Pre-K... Uh, small uh, Medicaid money, small federal and state grants that don't come through DPI, those go into Fund 8, the other special revenue fund. That's right. uh, okay. Well, thank you for being here to explain this. Yep, certainly. Mr. Floyd. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I um, I watched you before as a non-board member. I'm probably one of <laughs> you that watched and enjoyed that. Um, <laughs> very exciting stuff. I appreciate you breaking it down in ways that are simple, and I apologize for the question, really, because I try to get with you guys before these meetings to, to get through this stuff. So I, I've, mine's simple. I share the concerns, you know, that, that everybody does, and I think I think last time we did this, the concerns were there. So this downward trajectory, are we confident we have stopped that downward trajectory and are able to turn that in the right direction yeah I, I mean we're all because 1.7 now ain't yeah. what 1.7 was three right. years ago you know and who knows what it'll be in three more no, so and I, I think the real question to start asking is how do we restore the fund balance going forward right right yeah. and, and, and is there something you build into your budgetary process and to me the answer to that's yes that literally speaks to a restoration of fund balance and I would I would anticipate having that as a line item in the proposed budget we're going to present and, and that's a much way. bigger discussion than this so absolutely I'd love to have with you I just want to make yeah. sure we generally address that yeah mr. Treadway thank you uh, one of the concerns I have about the diminished fund balance is that just like at at home if 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 your reserves are low I think it impacts your decision making sure negatively you start thinking very short term at the cost of long term visions and 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 that that's one of my concerns is that you know as as our reserve is is less um, uh, as a board we have to start thinking more short term and I just don't know if that's healthy uh, uh, I don't know if that's i don't I don't know that it shifts my thinking. About I'm talking about us more than yeah. I am you, really. Uh, but but I'm, 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 
I'm supposed to feed you the information mm-hmm. that helps you make a good decision, right? And, and, I, and I appreciate what you're saying. I, I guess the, the real answer is to that, though, you wouldn't sacrifice the long term over a short term decision. Right. I, I, I mean, that's that's should really it, what you want. It, you should it, yeah. but if you don't have the reserves, it may right. limit those options. It may that's, limit the options. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. It comes again. Yeah. Miss Sandage. Oh, Brian asked my question, but I do want to make make note that I think that we spent the money on good things, and I think that we were very frugal in our spending when we could be. Um, that's not my issue. My issue is, even you said this con- This is concerning, and I want to see how we fix it. Yeah. I don't see that right now, so that's what yeah. makes it more concerning for and, me. And I guess I would just caution that's not a short-term process, right? The, the fix is going to take you far longer than it took to, to get to the point where you spent the money down. Yeah. In my history of doing this, school system can spend 10 years building a fund balance and spend it in three. And that's just the nature of it. And I do have one question I'd like to ask is, can you provide the board with a list of, like over the last three years, what's come out of fund balance? Like, can you provide that? Because I know at one point in time, the county, when they'd ask us to spend down our fund balance, yeah. they were going to give us back four million dollars at some point, and I would like to see if that was ever. And that happened during our... twenty two, twenty three. It did. Yeah, because okay. I actually just proved that to myself the other day, going through some of the financial reports. Okay. So, yeah. Um, that, that that would be the difference between the eighty point nine and the seventy six point six yeah. in county revenue. Yeah. yeah. There was, I, I believe, over the years, memory serving it. There's been transfers to capital. There has been technology purchases, uh, one-to-one initiatives. Again, all very good things, but very costly. Yeah. Any other questions, Mr. Floyd? One more thing. Is there somewhere, this is a, a new board member question here, somewhere I get my hands on, if I want to look back, one of the things I'm ready to move on from is seeing financials compared year over year from pandemic years. So a lot of times I like to compare net position now to 2019, for example, to determine, well, I mean, I know it's a different time, but just to also get a look, is there somewhere I can get a historic? Yeah, the the ACFRs that are on our website Mm -hmm. have historical data in the back of what's called the RSI section. Statistical section. Yeah, Yeah. that will have all that running back 10 years? 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Floyd, I think that's on board docs. Yeah, I figured it was somewhere. I'm still finding my way around. Thank you. Anything else? uh, I know that she's got more information. There is one thing we should talk about because it would be disingenuous to come up here and not talk about it. There was an audit finding, which is very, very unusual for us. Uh, so I want Adam to kind of lay it out. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to skip ahead to um, the, the finding is related to school food service expenditures. Um, so we can talk about it in conjunction with the school food service. Um, Cash on hand at the school uh, in the Child Nutrition Fund went up $1.4 million, but sales and uh, USDA reimbursements went down $4.2 million, while food costs remain the same and salaries went up. Your Child Nutrition Fund has been profitable through the pandemic because all kids ate for free. They ate at a higher reimbursement rate. 2022-23, kids came off of that that feeding program had to go back to the old USDA reimbursement where you do applications and some students are paying. So you saw a dip in revenue and a dip in participation. But that cash on hand that you were able to build up actually put you in a position where you had to do what was called a spend down plan. You're not held, you don't have to give money away, but you are encouraged to figure out what you're going to spend the excess cash on. One of the things you decided to spend the excess cash on was over $2 million worth of equipment. That equipment uh, wasn't budgeted for within the budget of the uh, child nutrition fund. Uh, Previous finance officers had those purchases run directly into the balance sheet, but then would incorporate the knowledge that there were expenditures because the child nutrition fund you actually have to capitalize assets that you buy directly into the balance sheet. So you pay for it, you, that's an expenditure, but it's not an expense. And that's the difference between fund balance and net position. It's re- revenues are revenues, expenditures aren't expenses, and fund balance isn't net position. 
So you expend money outward to buy those, but then you capitalize them in the balance sheet. Again, past finance officers knew to look at what was spent as an expenditure for equipment that was then capitalized. But it, you, uh, this year with that $2 million, it just wasn't budgeted for in expenditures and it was booked directly into the balance sheet. So let me, let me add on that a little bit for history, right? Two, two CFOs ago, that CFO had the knowledge of you had to do a budget entry to support the fact that you're going to be buying capital directly into the balance sheet. She made the budget entry to do that. In the transition to the next CFO, that knowledge got lost. So really what this comes down to is, is a 90-second entry in the accounting system that would have solved the problem if that knowledge had transferred correctly. And what you're also going to see in the, in the financials is a corrective action plan under me that we've already fixed how to make sure this doesn't happen going forward. So I don't want to downplay it to say it's a clerical error, but literally a, 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 an entry into the accounting system would have solved for this problem and would have prevented the finding. Yeah. So again, um, through um, the, the end of the presentation here, there was uh, one reportable condition of finding. Um, you can, within the financial statements, the 80-page document, footnote 2 on page 36, you can see the amount that was overexpended. You can see discussion of that on page 72 and 73 about how it happened. And then the response, the corrective action plan is on page 74 of those financial statements. And again, it is a finding related to the School Board Fiscal Control Act. You have to budget for expenditures, even if they are for equipment that you end up capitalizing. But you didn't spend federal or state dollars incorrectly. These are all allowable expenditures. You don't owe any money back. You just needed to do a budget amendment. And so, again, not to downplay, it is certainly a violation and a finding and a significant deficiency in controls but it is not a, a loss of, of funds. It is not misspent funds. Uh, it really is a, a budgeting process and the controls around that budgeting process. Ms. Escobar. I think you just answered my question. So for the corrective action, we have to, you have to propose a budget amendment to us and then we have to vote or on that? We need to make the budget amendment entry that the state nutrition program, uh, the school nutrition program is looking for that would support their capital purchases for that year. That's okay, and I, and I do believe there are plans for future capital expenditures of equipment yeah. that again would require. So that, that entry has already been made for the 23-24 year that we're already in at this point and we now know to make sure that that gets documented going forward the right way. Okay, thank you. So. Ms. Sandage. So what's the penalty in layman's terms for all this? Uh, you, you get a slap on a wrist that says you have to come up with a corrective action plan. We have a finding, it's documented. We will readdress this finding next year, make sure that it has been corrected. Uh, the report that was sent to the Local Government Commission goes to DPI. DPI will require you to write a letter saying how you uh, plan on preventing it in the future, and then you go about your control structure with the new set of controls. So we will literally take the corrective action plan that's in the audited financials and send that as a response to the inquiry. Thank you. Okay. Anything good. else? I think That's we're it. good. No. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, board members, we'll go to 8.02, Cooperative Strategies, Long Range District Realignment Update with Dr. Jonathan Bowers and Mr. Just Justin Rich. Good evening again. Good evening once again, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Kapicki. Uh, it, I'm pleased tonight to uh, welcome Mr. Rich back to Cabarrus County Schools. Um, if you'll recall back in September, uh, Mr. Sturtz was with us and he presented the facilities master plan update. So he was able to provide the board with a bit of an update on the work that Cooperative Strategies had done throughout the summer leading up to the recommendations for the facilities plans moving forward. Uh, also occurring concurrently at that same time, Mr. Rich and his team have been working on the long range realignment study. Uh, tonight he's going to give you an update on the discussions that have been had with our internal redistricting committee and also the discussions that have been had with the focus groups up to this point. Those two groups have met with Cooperative to be able to uh, review some of the data and really some of the data framing exercises that they've been able to present that really are going to drive some of their efforts moving forward as we get closer to what will be the boundary proposal process. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Rich and uh, let him uh, speak to uh, what's been uh, taking place thus far. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. Um, 
I've got a lot of slides that I realized when we were looking at the presentation. Some of it is information that you all have seen before. Um, so I'm going to move quickly through them and please stop me if there's anything that you'd like for me to elaborate on. So as was mentioned, um, some of the data analysis that we want to present with you is information that we've been sharing with the internal redistricting committee and also the focus groups. You've seen similar things, I think, presenting them in a different way, kind of diving a little bit deeper in there, including enrollment utilization, feeder patterns, something that's called a close to school analysis, uh, where we look at hypothetical situations, uh, a residential update, um, and also diversity factors, which is something we'll be bringing to you for the first time. I'm going to just follow that up with a summary of our um, summary of our meetings up to this point and talk a little bit about how we're viewing uh, potential boundary options and the framework around that. So in terms of enrollment and utilization, again, this is information that we've shared with you before. On this slide, what we've done is we've uh, listed elementary schools and included both design uh, capacity and capacity when including mobile units and compared that to our current utilization in this school year and then five years out from now. Um, we've highlighted those, those utilization numbers using a color coding um, Green looks all good right now, up to 80%. Uh, yellow, time to start paying a little bit closer attention and perhaps make some, um, some planning decisions. And then red uh, being over capacity. Again, current is that sort of middle, middle group of columns there. And then plus five years is the next five columns. Uh, we start to see more red, certainly. But that's not surprising based on what we've reviewed with you and and the kind of growth that we've seen. Just to visualize that on a map, uh, breaking up those elementary school attendance boundaries and looking at those across the district, there's quite a bit in the western portion of the district where we see that, um, you know, we see that impact in being over capacity. And when we look out five years, it starts to spread a little bit more. You start to see more yellow as opposed to green in the central portions of the district. At the middle school level, as we've talked about before, we don't see that same kind of um, utilization crunch that we do at the elementary and high school levels. But when we look out five years, when we look out beyond that, uh, we start to see that residential development catch up. Um, and, and we do have those situations where you're beyond capacity in the future. Again, just to visually represent that on the map, on the left-hand side, uh, our current situation, a lot more yellow and green, uh, plus five years out from now, we start to see more red. And then finally, at the high school level, um, currently we have some situations where uh, we are right at capacity when we're considering mobile, uh, mobile units over capacity if we're looking at design uh, capacity, but Looking five years out from now, now we start to see Cox Mill, Hickory Ridge, West Cabarrus really be impacted. Um, again, to visualize that on a map, we sort of see that all over uh, the district, especially on the western portion. I'm just going to run through this again. I thought it would be helpful. We've talked about this in the past. Uh, this is our feeder pattern analysis. Uh, up at the top, we show in those gray boxes the various high schools. In the green boxes are those middle schools that feed into those high schools, along with a percentage indicating the number of students from those schools that are feeding into the next level. And then the yellow boxes show uh, those elementary schools that feed into the middle schools. I'm bringing this up because there's a couple of examples where there are small, what we would call small feeds, small groups of students, uh, less than 10%, that feed from the elementary level to the middle school level on to the high school level. Those kids have a very unique journey where, with a smaller group of kids that kind of go on that journey with them. Um, we think during this boundary process it's, it's important to keep an eye on that, uh, which we have been doing. When we look at West Cabarrus, I think one of the unique things here is that while every other high school has one or two middle schools that feed into it, West Cabarrus has five middle schools. So uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think there, <laughs> there are um, 
things to ask about that. Is that is that good for continuity? Is that good for you know having uh, groups of students with with familiarity? Uh, those are good questions to ask. Uh, and then finally, Northwest Cabarrus Concord uh, and Mount Pleasant High Schools. Um, you see these are more traditional where a single middle school is feeding into a high school um, or at least a large portion. Um, the one thing I'll point out here is that Concord High School, you have um, six different elementary schools that ultimately feed in. So again, a similar situation, something to keep in mind as we're considering boundary changes that will ultimately affect these feeder patterns. Also in the past, we've shared with you some information about future residential development, and I'm sure this is um, not a surprise, just the amount of development that will continue to happen within the county. Uh, on this slide, what we've done is we've categorized that on the map on the right-hand side <clears throat> based on the stage in the entitlement process that these projects are. So in the upper left-hand corner, we have some definitions. It shows that um, those projects that are in the proposed stage or those that are shown on the map in purple means that the application for that development has been submitted. If they're approved, they're shown in yellow, and that shows that whatever the reviewing authority, the city or the county, um, has approved the project, but they still may want some changes. So it's in that initial approval process. Uh, there's still a long way to go in terms of seeing finished lots and houses. In review means that the project is approved and they're having final review of the plan. That's really, um, you know, almost there in, in terms of how, how active that project will be. And then active means that structures are being built on those lots or there's active grading going on. You have finished lots. You're in a position where you're going to see uh, finished homes there. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to the table. So what we see in those last two categories, the ones that are most, um, you know, the ones that we will see most quickly here, active and in review, are just about 14,000, 14,500 units or so. And I would guess, um, you know, generally that means sometime in the next zero to, you know, three to five years or so. Um, so those are coming quick. Uh, we've also categorized this information down at the bottom, just single family detached versus multifamily units. So we've um, summarized those down there. There's a lot of multifamily units that are coming. Um, I will also note that this has excluded those age restricted units that were previously included in some of our data. That's about 350 units. So this is an exercise, uh, an analytical exercise that we went through and there was sometimes confusion about this. This is not intended uh, to be an actual recommendation for boundaries. This is simply to illustrate some of the difficulties that exist in trying to draw boundaries based on certain criteria. For instance, in a boundary process, we often hear kids should go to their closest school. So what we've done here is we've uh, engaged in that hypo hypothetical situation to test whether or not that would work and it clearly in this case would not work and the reason why is because you have schools that are too big and you have schools that are way too small and so that imbalance in utilization is what we're trying to show certainly there are things that we can think about or a little um, you know it helps illustrate certain points maybe we could take this part of you know a neighborhood and include that in a given boundary i think that can be instructive um, but it doesn't work if we applied that blanket logic so at the elementary school level again we have schools that are uh, 40 percent or less than 50 percent and then some that are uh, 160 170 180 percent so um, again this is not a proposal helping to illustrate a point about why um, that doesn't work in all situations at the middle and high school levels, not surprisingly, similar kinds of situations. Um, I think what you can draw from this is an indication of how densely populated certain boundaries are or lack of density and how, how spread out and sparsely populated. So that certainly is interesting and probably things that you all know intuitively. Um, but, but sometimes it's hard to figure out where a boundary begins and ends. And this is a good reminder, I think, of that. 
Something that we've talked about first here at the board level, um, later in the internal redistricting committee, um, and then finally with the focus groups is how are we going to measure diversity? And so um, what we've done is we've come up with three different diversity factors, which are things that we can measure and help to identify what happens as a result of, of boundary changes so that we're not taking our eye off the ball there. Um, I, I will note that oftentimes we'll look at socioeconomic data related to free and reduced lunch status. Uh, in the state of North Carolina, we can't do that. We can't use student level data. We can use school level data, but when we start to analyze changes and how that affects specific areas, since we don't have that student level data, we can't rely on that. So this is um, hopefully a workaround, a way to be able to still capture some of that information that is relevant and helpful. Um, and the first thing we looked at was the language spoken at home. So taking American community survey data and um, looking at the census block groups that cover the county um, and then applying that to all of the various students that live within uh, Cabarrus County Schools and assigning them these values, it allows us to be able to see if we, you know, first of all, we aggregated them and we've included that, that, that on the slide here. Um, and as we start to make changes and as we start to evaluate boundary scenarios, we'll be able to see how those things uh, are, are altered. I will note that in terms of language spoken at home, we've grouped that together to be language spoken at home other than English. Uh, just for uh, the sake of summarizing this, um, what we see is that based on that data, about 14 and a half percent of households in the district where English is not the primary language spoken at home. So I um, think that will be helpful as we are looking at these boundary options uh, and seeing how that changes. The next category that we looked at was educational attainment. And we, we looked at that based on um, point values that, that we assigned, um, a point value of one means that there's no high school diploma or equivalent, and then moving on to a point value of eight means that's a doctorate degree, uh, something on that level. And so when we calculate that, applying that same, same information, so for all adults over 25 within the household and looking at that, um, that educational attainment, uh, we're able to compare that across all of uh, the boundaries within the district and the overall average is 3.6. So what that means is that in terms of um, the educational attainment across the district, that's somewhere in between having some, co some college but not, pr not quite yet uh, having an associate's degree. Um, and then finally, average household income. So I think that's more straightforward and what most folks are, are, are accustomed to hearing. So we took the average household income uh, across the district. Again, the tables show what those calculations were. Uh, and what we see is an average household income of about $102,000. Um, and again, that's average household income. So the entire, uh, not median um, and uh, not per capita. So just want to clarify those points. So quickly, just uh, in terms of our progress with the internal redistricting committee, we've met three times now, August, September, and October. And, and the participants that are involved in this really in, are, include district staff and leadership. And the reason why we're meeting with them is to make sure that we understand the implications of any decisions that are made and try to make sure that when we're um, thinking about from a transportation perspective, from a program perspective, from all of those different lenses that uh, these folks um, with that expertise and that experience uh, to just really inform um, this process uh, and also to help us as we start preparing options, which we'll be doing shortly here, um, as we start sharing those options, where did we get it wrong and how can we make this better? And um, you know, from, again, all of those different lenses to be able to understand that. Um, also, we are, we've met with our focus groups. There's two focus groups that, that we meet with each time, and that first, um, those first meetings happened on October 11th 
where we shared some background data uh, and went through some discussion questions with them. And then two weeks later, we met with them again, uh, sort of continuing that background data, um, but also talking about options framework, which we'll talk a little bit about tonight. <clears throat> we asked them some discussion questions. What are your biggest concerns about this process? Uh, do you think that utilization across the district is, is important or is it acceptable to have varying degrees of that? And then what surprises you about the data that we've shared with you? Um, we heard some really interesting things, and I think some uh, were predictable. Some were, you know, I think were things that we were glad were brought up and, um, you know, highlighted some different, um, different perspectives. Things that came up a lot had to do with travel times, um, but also we spent some time kind of talking about travel times versus distance traveled versus transportation impacts from a busing perspective. We're all different things, but related. Um, so we talked about that. Um, we heard from several people, how will diversity be accounted for? Uh, this is part of our response to that, are those diversity factors that, that we've shared. Um, we heard a lot about managing future growth. Uh, who gets to approve future uh, residential development projects? They were surprised that the school district isn't, or Cabarrus County Schools isn't involved in that land use approval. Um, they were concerned about multiple reassignments uh, for given areas in a short period of time, which certainly we're sensitive to. Uh, they wanted to understand the impact of overutilized schools and what that means for program choice. Um, and they also just want to know how are we sharing this with their neighbors, with their friends, families, community members. So, so we talked about that as well. Finally, I'll just end with um, what we've shared with them, um, framework and this, this idea about framework. We have all of these different criteria that we've discussed and all different ways that we can look at these we can look at the data and we can analyze it and we can look at boundary options and it can get kind of overwhelming. And so what we're trying to do is build a framework where we're focused on some particular things right now to see if we can accomplish those. Balancing utilization, trying to address feeder patterns, thinking about proximity or, uh, you know, those areas that might relate to, um, you know, efficiencies in transportation, kids being able to walk to school, those sorts of things. Uh, and then finally, diversity as well. How, do, how is diversity affected by, uh, you know, all of these proposals, um, you know, options that we're looking at? Quickly on the process, um, you know, we're, we've covered a lot of ground thus far and um, what we have in head, what we have ahead of us is, um, focus groups next week. Uh, we're meeting with the internal redistricting committee again this week. Um, and then ultimately the last week of November we'll be meeting with the community for different meetings uh, during that week um, to each night where we're going to share options. We're going to give them opportunities to be able to um, provide us with feedback, uh, which we'll ultimately share with you. That's it for me tonight. Any questions, board members? Ms. Sandage? So um, what I have heard on a few occasions is that um, when you go to the, oh, what is that system called? It's a brain fart here. To ask, yes, engage. there you go, engage. When you go to that system and ask a question, the responses are very vague. So over the weekend, I got an email that was very specific about like lots of questions and I ended up telling the person let me process where to put this at or where to send this yeah. um, and I just didn't know how to respond to that so when you hear someone say that the responses are vague and it doesn't help me plan what do you respond to that and where should I send this email so this person can get some questions and I mean it's a long one too yeah I think we can it make sense to send that through the questions on CCS engage um, and, and answer it there. I will warn that folks oftentimes want to get more information than is currently available or that jumps ahead in the process. So happy to working with district staff, figure out how to address that in a way that's responsible right now. But we don't know who's moving or who's going to be impacted or what community specifically and all of that. Those are things that we've heard in the focus groups and Sometimes there's people that want to jump ahead to that. Other things just related to the process, happy to 
absolutely address that. Yeah, they seemed more processed to me oh, good. that I didn't I didn't I didn't know how to answer. Yeah. So I'll I'll send it to somewhere to get it to engage. What I got was this person has already been sending it to engage and yeah. just not okay. getting yeah. their questions answered. So I don't know next steps for that person. So what I what I can say to that question is this. Um it's understandable, and I think uh, Justin did a nice job just there answering that. Some of the information that folks want, we just don't have the answers yet. And we're not trying to be vague intentionally. We're trying to be thoughtful in our responses so that we don't say the wrong thing or, or give misleading answers as well. We want, we've been very transparent and open about this process from day one. So I don't want to apologize for being vague. What I would say is we are with great intention considering all the questions, and sometimes to Justin's point, they want information we just don't have yet. And I think our community has been very patient, and very supportive. It's just we're trying to be very thoughtful as to how we answer those questions that we don't get ahead of ourselves and say the wrong thing or put something out there that's just not accurate or ready to be answered. The other thing I would remind folks is to look at the right side of the column on the Engage page. Every single presentation, every single meeting, the FAQs are up there, all the date and the timelines are up there. There is an enormous amount of information on there that, that answers a lot of the questions for folks if they take the time to go through a lot of those presentations. And then I also think that as we continue into our third community focus meeting next week and then thereafter we have the, the four community meetings that I spoke of in my comments that come up, it's going to give people a chance to come out live and speak to us and ask myself and, and, and Justin uh, questions that I think we can probably at that point probably answer many more of the, their concerns, but I'll be very frank, some of those questions they might ask us, we just not, we may not be ready to or prepared to answer that because as you see yourself this evening, there's so much data and so much evidence we have to kind of go through so that we get it right and make sure we understand all the dynamics around what people expect, especially when you talk to those prior priorities that are coming up over and over again, diversity, proximity, things of that, that nature. So um, again, we're not trying to be vague, we're trying to be very careful that we make sure that we stick to what we said. We're going to answer the questions as on spot as we can, exactly as we can, and we don't mislead anybody. So I, I hear you, and I understand that. I really truly do, because I, I, I have people tell me that all the time. And um, I would just, again, ask people just remind to be patient. Mid-January, we're going to lay this out, rec make our recommendations to the board, and then I think everyone will know the direction at that point. Mr. Floyd? Yeah, I appreciate that question. Uh, Ms. Sanders, because I obviously get, I'm sure we all do. Is it fair to say, very simply, for the public's benefit, the answers are vague because the answers are vague right now? Uh, I mean, it's a vague situation we're figuring out. So my question to you is um, one of the discussion themes I really appreciate coming up, um, and you've done this a few times. This isn't your first realignment. So managing what I what I call multi-districting, you know, one kid four or five times in their in their life. What kind of controls can you talk to us about without getting too deep into it? Do we have in place or do we do to keep that from getting out of control or keep an eye on that for some of these kids that get redistricted more than once? Yeah, that's a great question. I think fortunately the district has a lot of historical information that they track in an organized way using geographical information systems. So physically knowing what those areas are, when they were moved, uh, how that was done. Um, I think one way that you avoid it is by trying to look a little bit longer further out. Oftentimes we see boards uh, take incremental approaches because that's the easy way out and I understand that. I, I don't like having, um, you know, community, <laughs> I don't like having community members upset with us because they're being moved. But again, I think if you take the longer view and maybe go a little bit further, um, that sometimes when, when you know it's the right thing, um, that, that can be challenging, but in the end, it'll be better. Uh, and then finally, I think that the tools that uh, the, the district has are implementation related. Um, how do you deal with uh, students that might be at the end of their um, school, at, at, at that particular school in the upper grade levels, fifth grade, eighth grade, uh, 12th grade? How, how do you ensure that those rising uh, students, rising fifth graders, right, you know, so on and so forth, um, that they can kind of finish out what they started because that would be pretty disruptive. Um, and so oftentimes there will be certain, uh, you know, exemptions and things like that that are made. 
school districts have to be very careful with that because oftentimes trying to do that and trying to accommodate that undoes what you know originally led to the process so that can be challenging but I think as long as that um, you know there's um, certain laid out well and thought through what the uh, you know what the unintended consequences are of that I think it can be very successful does that help it does and yeah, uh, yeah I didn't mean to open the can of worms of grandfather uh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally on the spot um, I think it's also important to say that we and going back to getting this right so that we don't multi-district going forward you know we yeah. get this right we get this done and we can put a stop to that because that's kind of what got us in this spot in the first place Ms. Escobar <laughs> thank you for this information the community meetings that are um, at the end of the month uh, there are a lot of people that aren't going to be able to make them it's just the timing um, I'm also a little concerned that they're like back to back um, so it'll you know there's limited time it's not like you're going to be there to answer questions all night long so um, for people who aren't going to be able to attend I'm guessing that your presentation your recommendations will be um, available on the engage site and then if people have detailed questions then those answers would be less vague because at that point we would have more specific things to say is That's that right. correct so That's I just correct. I just want to make sure that encourage people to come if you can come I recognize that you might not I mean it's after school uh, kids and stuff but um, but if they if they have specific questions try to come out to those so they can hear it um, and then follow up with us afterwards yeah, that's, that's exactly right. The same information that will be presented at those meetings in person will be available online. Uh, absolutely, we encourage people. It, it can be challenging to get away, at, you know, as I know when you have kids and you're trying to balance all these things. So that's where we're trying to make it very um, comparable. The experience that you would get by being there in person, we're going to make it very easy for you to be able to uh, watch that presentation and understand what is being shared have all of that other background and reference information at your fingertips um, and finally put some other tools on there also that might be able to help you understand how this impacts you in a particular area uh, so that will be available as well and then to understand the timeline so that's end of November we're not going to see you in December you guys are going to work together and then in January will get information based on those community meetings that's correct okay so just so everyone understand how how it's going which is why right now we can't answer a lot of stuff that's exactly right okay mr walter okay thank you for your time thanks for coming tonight and sharing the information some questions on the on the presentation that i had again you have the now numbers and you have five-year numbers is that based on the other thing that slides that she showed us about the development is that how 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 did you calculate the numbers i guess yeah the the numbers are based on enrollment projections those, Enroll those are from, from the development or is it uh it it includes um i want to be clear about this so when you do enrollment projections based off of uh the methodology that cooperative strategies uses um, it does include in areas that are growing it there is an assumption that it will continue to grow based on that um, so yes it, it is included based on that but also our housing projections are are separate we don't um, want to make sure this makes sense if if we took that cohort survival factor method and then we added in development to it it might be double counting some of that so so we try to separate that in a way that um, you know captures just those recent trends it's so, some folks take a calculation based on how large the house is on how many kids should be expected from that development right that that's that's not the level that this is the student potential analysis which which we've prepared uh, has that information about those those specific those specific data points so the, the current information is that include program choice does not include program choice has how did you so there, there is some information that we've shared that, that shows the breakdown of program choice, what students are coming into a given boundary, what, which students are leaving that boundary, and those, but those specific uh, numbers that we shared with you, the current ones, mm -hmm. factor in that program choice. So do factor in the same pro program choice as we had five, five, in five years? Uh, doesn't have five years in there. It, it has the current program choice for the, for the current. that are in there. Okay. 
Um, I thought the closest school uh, slide was very interesting. It's a, it, tells, it does tell you a lot because again, you can't everybody can't get to their closest school. That isn't yep. uh, feasible, but it is it is a goal um, for a lot. Of, I mean, it's is one of the high things to consider. Um, and then, have you gone far enough to figure out how many kids might be need to be moved for us to balance balance our schools? Do we have an idea on how many kids will be affected? Uh, we we have that information. I don't have that tonight for you because we don't have a we don't have something that we're sharing yet. But but we will calculate that as we're sharing those scenarios with you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Just a quick reminder. Just an update to the board too. Um, our day 40 count this year was 35,025 students. Today is day 60. In there and about, we're at 35,204. So we've grown 179 students since that time period. So just to continue to remind you that our numbers are, they're not, they are, they're panning out. That's what the predictors are saying they're going to be. So right now we're at 35,204. Any other questions, board members? Okay. I think Thank we're done. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, we'll move to 8.03, our support plan for low-performing schools with Dr. Jonathan Bowers and Ms. Sarah Reeves. Welcome back again. Good evening yet again. <laughs> it's good to see you again, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Kapicki. Uh, joining me tonight, uh, Ms. Sarah Reeves, our Chief Academic Officer, and Dr. Mike Williams, our uh, Chief Human Resources Officer. And, and again, let me start by saying that this presentation you're about to see, uh, this a lot of folks in this room had a lot to do with this. Uh, this is just merely, uh, this is the work of the districts, the work of staff, uh, but it really, uh, the three of us will speak to some of the highlights, but I do have to give credit for those that certainly that are populating these rows here that um, they've been instrumental in helping us develop this. Um, as we've presented to you over the previous months, we've talked a lot about school improvement planning. We've talked a lot about the process. We've talked a lot about how we are looking to reframe our efforts and to create a more uh, supportive, uh, uniform, um, data-driven, thoughtful, intentional process. And much of this work, again, hats off to folks at the school level. They have really, really done yeoman's work on this and have truly embraced the spirit that is behind our continuous improvement framework. We started by identifying what is our framework, what is our North Star, what is going to be our blueprint, what is really that template to which we say this anchors our work to drive improvement for students across the district. And so the graphic that you see before you now is the embodiment of that. It captures what are going to be those key planning elements. And, and this again, those individuals I referenced before here in attendance tonight uh, were key parts of helping us build this. And this became the brand, this became the, the messaging, this became the, this is what we represent for our schools as we engage through this process of school improvement planning. And so this became the heart of how we approach this. And it's really shifting from a model to where we check boxes to where we put effort and energy behind our efforts to say what is going to make a difference for students. What is truly going to be those key leverage points, those key practices, those efforts, those resources, those supports that we can utilize such that we can expect to see gains for students. And so when you are able to shift the paradigm to a degree and focus exclusively on the student as at the center of this, and it's not a deadline, and it's not a procedural element, and it's not something that is just going to live on a shelf, and it really becomes a truly living, breathing approach to school improvement and district improvement planning, it, it helps create a culture that really drives us to continue to want to excel and to succeed. And so these planning elements that you see, these again, these aren't presented as just a, we're looking to have a pretty picture. This is presented as to truly effort and this is really key playing out because we've seen our schools do this day in, day out and continue to do it throughout this process. And so for us, we want to make sure that we are true to that. And the reason we're presenting this specifically for low performing schools for you tonight is that we wanted to make sure that we understood that that is all of our efforts. Traditionally and historically, the school improvement planning for low performing schools lied at the school level. And much of that took place with the schools really devising what are going to be their key approaches, their strategies, their goals, 
those resources and those supports to help their efforts. And that is noble. But what we want to do is double down on that. We want to say we as a district are committed to this. We as a school system are committed to making sure that our most needy students, our most at-risk schools, have the full force and full support of Cabarrus County Schools behind it. And so with that, we are going to share with you what is our district commitment to school support planning. What is our district commitment to our low-performing schools? And how can we now utilize tremendous resources to ensure that we're moving in the direction that we know that all students deserve? And so this framework is ground within that. Now, a few things I will share are some of the statutory requirements that we're obligated to honor. Because we don't engage in any of this work without first understanding what are our statutory requirements and what does board policy stipulate we must honor. So as the grounding framework you see here, some of those provisions that have been included, and we are certainly bringing attention to and we're highlighting for you tonight. Again, this does not suggest these things didn't occur. We just want to be intentional about saying, in our efforts to be able to reframe how we do this for Cabarrus County Schools, we are going to stand before you and say, our commitment is behind this, and you can see some resources and you'll see some of these strategies play out. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Williams, and he's going to talk about some of the practices and some of the supports that Human Resources has taken lead on, and then Ms. Rees will speak specifically about some of our instructional and academic supports we're going to utilize. All right, so uh, the legislation is, is clear that there are some human resources components for our local low-performing schools that have to be in place. If you look on the left side here, our NC Star is the uh, tool that we use to capture our school improvement plans that you guys have been looking at over the last few weeks. Um, and so specifically, human resources is working around A103, uh, where professional collaboration is valued and emphasized. Um, and specifically for us, we are uh, have done a, a significant amount of work. Mr. Reeves um, did much of this work at the beginning of the year with our principals to make sure that um, all of the folks in our in our low performing schools understand the process required by State Board of Education policy around teacher evaluation and appraisal. Um, and then we did some additional training for our low performing schools related to super observations. And um, the really short version of that is our, our our teachers and our principals and assistant principals in low-performing schools receive additional longer observations with very specific feedback focused on the school's goals for improvement. Um, and so we, uh, Cortland did a, a wonderful job making sure that our principals, our assistant principals, and our teachers had all of the information they needed uh, to be able to move forward with those super observations. Uh, and I would say not just in terms of being able to hit the deadlines, but in really using the observations as a, as a method to connect uh, improvement with the school improvement plans and with their, their movement to, uh, to come off of that low performing schools list. Um, further, those two bullet points at the bottom, um, as, a, as a district, we worked uh, very closely with our principals to make sure that they uh, understood the key elements that needed to be in their school improvement plans and were conducting quarterly continuous improvement support meetings that include cabinet uh, and the level assistance superintendents to concentrate and focus on those improvement plan goals to try to check those progress monitoring points um, and then to, to put in place a 10-week action planning support um, so that again the goal here is not just to check the boxes off the goal is to make sure that those schools that are on that low performing uh, list are actively moving forward to come off of that list and the and the ultimate result of coming off of that list is that our kids are being successful and we're seeing positive outcomes um, in their learning. So in conjunction with that, one of the things that we wanted to be really intentional about is what level of district support we deploy specifically to our schools that ended up on the low performing list so that we can be intentional about triangulating our efforts. So. Um, there is a lot that we do specifically as it relates to core supports, meaning things that we provide for all of our schools to intentionally help them understand how to use data, complete walkthroughs with different district personnel. Um, but specifically, we wanted to make sure that we provided an extra layer of support for our low-performing schools so that they truly understood 
what are the key criteria that are going to move you off of this designation? Um, we've talked a little bit before about how you land on, on the low performing schools list and certainly growth is not calculated nearly as much as we would like to see. Um, so really being intentional about saying when you're looking at your school improvement plan goals, specifically as it relates to teaching and learning because that is really the targeted goal that we would want to see proficiency moving in the positive direction so that they would not be designated as a low performing school in the fall of the next year. So we've done a lot of intentional efforts around having some coaching conversations with our building level leaders to say this is what the proficiency measure would need to look like in order for you to move off of the low performing list but then additionally really helping them think strategically not only about staffing but a problem of practice in their school. So whether that's around a specific grade level or content area and uh, we we are working intentionally to provide bi-weekly walkthroughs around that targeted area of focus, so a problem of practice. So as you know, in an elementary, middle, or high school, when we're specifically looking at end of grade or end of course tests, which are, are the true means of proficiency measurements for a low-performing school, um, we, are, we are taking that problem of practice and using research-based strategies and a coaching model so that we can continue to have dialogue around movement in the positive direction so that we're saying, to Dr. Williams' point, not only are we having the quarterly data digs, but also in practice in your school when we are walking classrooms every two weeks and providing support for your staff and personnel around professional development, professional learning communities, what's happening in the classroom, how can we leverage our specialists and coordinators to be able to work in conjunction in service of your students. So that has been very um, not only intentional but really strategic and so we're working across departments to be able to specifically provide a more comprehensive level of central office support so that not only are they getting everything that all of our other schools get in terms of professional development and data disaggregation meetings but also this level of customized support where someone is coming out to your school and coaching and supporting you and your team so that we can um, come together in this effort to be able to support you. So to touch upon two key elements here, what you see, and I'm going to back up a slide, the Dimension A you seem referenced, these are key indicators aligned with an NC STAR. NC STAR is our planning tool. It doesn't do the school improvement planning for us, it's just merely the vessel or the vehicle through which school improvement planning takes place. And so in order to make sure that schools, again, we have a consistent uniform measure in place for our low performing schools to say, where can we identify that these practices are playing out? That's what the key indicator will do. So they will select that key indicator. And then associating with that key indicator, they'll include those action items that both Dr. Williams and Ms. Reed spoke about. And those action items will say, what can we expect to see throughout the year as schools are going to effort these strategies. And again, many of these are district level. It's not schools having to do more. It's the district partnering with schools and ensuring we have a comprehensive support and a comprehensive approach to this. So you will see each of these actions are district led statements. Last piece that we have shared with you Part of the package tonight that you have, you have the low performing schools, school improvement plans. The, the report that was shared with you in that particular package or agenda item is referred to as the Student Success Comprehensive Report. That report gives you a more of a unabridged, if I may, version of what play takes place at the school level. It's a little bit longer than the hour summary reports that have been shared that you've seen previously. Um, this one the reason it was shared is it spells out those practices for you and you can see them. But to truly gauge all the efforting that takes place, you really have to go to each school's website. And I'll talk about that in another item we have queued up later. Sorry, you got to see me one more time tonight. Um, but when that happens, uh, we'll walk through and show exactly where you can go to see some of this real time through the NC Star platform. I think that that certainly would be beneficial. But you see on this timeline we've presented here, um, our school improvement plans have been shared right, with the Board of Education. You'll see then um, on November the 5th, all right, preliminary differentiated school support plan with the Board of Education was also shared all right, with you. Uh, 
Today, load performing school designation plans are shared through the SIP website. What will happen is that after tonight's proposal, by statute, if you go back to that, schools have to then have a window of 30 days by which they display their school improvement plan. In that 30 days, they then allow for what would it to be to comment or feedback from their community. We have uh, worked with our communications team. Again, Mr. Furr has been instrumental in this. We're going to use Parent Square as a means to collect that feedback such that we too can see what is being shared from the members of our community and what they have to offer for their particular input and we can then share that out with the schools. So again, we don't want to certainly go directly and bombard the schools with this. We want to make sure that we're somewhat strategic about how we're collecting it because that will help us too in our efforts moving forward. So that 30-day window will certainly uh, take place. Uh, and then what will happen is that we will certainly uh, come back before the board in December uh, after the 30-day window has passed, uh, certainly review any updates, field any questions you might have, uh, and then we'll be asking for approval from the board for this year's school improvement plans for our low-performing schools. So I'll pause there for any questions amongst for any of us. Ms. Escobar. Thank you, and thank you for all the work that's been done. Um, I was going through them, and it's yeah, it's a lot. I, I guess what I wanted to say overall, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of the measures that you really made sure that, that they're not just goals, that we can try to measure these goals, that there's data to, to link with that. And I also appreciate that it's not just test scores. We're looking at sense of belonging. We're looking at parent communication. Um, but I did want to ask about those because so, it looks like it's some of these schools that we're looking at right now, um, they have the biggest um, uh, room to improve. And, um, and those seem, some of those goals seemed really ambitious, 100% um, communication with parents. Um, and, you know, the sense of belonging jumping like 30%. Mm -hmm. um, if we were looking at test scores, we would never make that big of a leap. So I guess what I'm asking is, how are you making sure that they, this is achievable? And if they don't achieve it, um, what? how do we help them? So what, what I would say is it's a collaborative effort. So every principal and every every uh, team member was on this, established those goals with us. We didn't say, you will do this. We asked for their input to, to formulate those goals. So credit to them. Um, and I know you're not saying this, so I don't mean this in a bad way, but 100% you know, communication, I think, is, is the expectation. And um, we have pushed our principals to be thoughtful and reasonable about some of the, uh, what I always say is this, to be real simple, it's not all about test scores. It just isn't. And if we all think that it is, we're kidding each other. That's not to say the test scores don't matter. They do matter. We are accountable to them, and we want to always be improving and setting the expectations very high. But we also have to look at all the other factors and variables that go into some of these schools. School A is very different than School B than School C, and some of the things that School A needs, School B does not need, and School C may, school C may never need. So I think when you see a lot of these accountability measures and a lot of the different things that are consistent throughout them, um, what we're trying to do is address the immediate needs within the building specific to that building by listening to the teachers, the community, and the administrators that are there and working with them to establish these goals. So none of these goals were set to say we didn't set them. We worked in collaboration with the schools to establish those goals. Ms. Rees, would you like to add to that? You were gonna... I would just say the only other thing that I think in terms of putting processes in place to support is that we do have the continuous school improvement meeting. So we're meeting with them quarterly and backwards mapping. So if you were started at 30%, 50% parent participation, where would we like to see gradual releases and chunking it by quarter? So we're liking, we like to see incremental change over the course of the entire year. Um, certainly if you wait till the end of the year and you expect to be at 100% parent communication and you haven't benchmarked and progress monitored that each quarter, that's going to be a really, really ambitious goal. However, we're bringing them in, we're having conversations with all of Cabinet, and I think we're making really intentional efforts to say, 
using the resources and tools at the district level, such as Parent Square, how can we partner in service of your school to better support you with these ambitious goals? Because it is going to take a lot more support. It's going to be strategic, and we're using district level personnel to come alongside the schools and be able to support them with that. But um, we actually have an upcoming continuous school improvement meeting coming at the end of this month, and I'm really excited because we're actually going to be able to say, Based on where where we're at at the end of November, where should you be? How are you progressing? Where are there areas that you might not be where you need to be right now? And then let's make a concerted effort across all of our departments to help provide supports for you to get you there by the next time we meet, um, which will be in January. Mr. Walter. Yeah, um, just to clarify, to be on, on this list, has to be what a DNF, DRF school, and not meeting growth. Is that how you get on this list? It, not meeting or have met growth. So, so if you've only yes, met or if you've not met growth. Yes, sir. So it's a school performance to take, uh, grade designation by the state of DRF, and the school did not meet or met growth. Okay, and we're talking about all these things that we're doing new. Um, we had what six, six schools on it last year. We had schools six schools on it this year. We got two that dropped off and. Two that got added. What yeah. are the two that dropped off? What are they doing right that we can maybe utilize? Um, it's also part of the conversations as well because we want to emulate that. You're exactly right. Learning best practices from each of our own and seeing how we can apply that moving forward. And that's what much of this will include as we're able to then work collectively with schools. So we, we have this approach that's extended outward, but we want to make sure that we are learning from our own to be able to apply that moving forward. And so right, I just want to make sure that that's, that's covered because somebody, that's well some, somebody within our district, they were able to figure out at least move, move from a low-performing school yes, off sir. that list, and I think that's uh, commendable. So. That's well said. Any other questions about this? Mr. Chatterway? I, I applaud this and um, the, in, the intentionality behind it. I, I just I want us to be cognizant of the fact that um, – we're talking about the schools where we need our best teachers yes, and we don't want to unintentionally add impediments that that might get in the way of retaining or recruiting good teachers and so uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir uh, the other thing is that um, overlooking some of the goals if we want to reduce speeding on highway 49 we probably have to write more speeding tickets first I'm just uh, I'm a little concerned that sometimes we we set metrics that might not necessarily reflect what we really want which is improved discipline or whatever so I guess let's just be careful let's be careful that we don't put unintentionally impediments in the way of folks trying to to do what they can with their with their kids um, uh, I, I know you folks I know you agree with me on that but uh, I just don't want to I don't want to hamstring. The, the, the root word of support is the same root word that to endure. Let's help them endure because yeah. they have long days already That's and uh, we want to make sure that we can support them in, in, in the right way. Yes, sir. And you, you captured that. That's why much of this we want to take onus of some of that ourselves and not outsource it back out. You're exactly We right. don't want to add to their burden. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's right. This is what, it's really a district support plan as well. Mr. Trader, I want to reiterate too what you just said. These are all good schools. They just need exactly what you said. It's kind of like, what, to me, the definition of equity is some schools need more of. Support goes along the same line. Some schools just need more support. So I, can, I appreciate your comments, but I want to reiterate, these are good schools with good teachers. They just need more support. So I appreciate those comments. Thank you. Any other comments? I would just like to say thank you for coming up and giving us more details on how you're interacting with these schools in the process that's not really showed when we get a piece of paper that just has three goals on there it helps us to understand you know what the actually strategic part of it is so thank you very much for putting this presentation for us thank you I think the last thing I will I don't want to be able but I don't want to bring Carl Sane up here <laughs> but I want to remind everyone about the but it, again a lot of this goes to the, to the way it's great the 80 percent performance 20 percent growth let's I, we don't want to lose the force for the trees on how this comes about how you end up getting that letter there's a lot more that goes into it um, so I just want to remind you of that so thank you
Okay, board members, uh, it is 8.30. Would you want to take a five-minute break before we go forward to guest speakers? Okay, we're going to take a five-minute break, and we'll come back and start um, our guest speakers address the board.
Okay, welcome back. We will start at 9.01. Our guest speakers address the board. I'll now read our procedural part of this. It is now time for public comment. Each speaker will be allowed up to three minutes to speak and an individual speaking for a group may be allowed up to five minutes at the discretion of the board chair to express interest and concerns related to the official business of the board and school district. The speakers will be called in the order in which we receive the request. A person may not be substituted for a speaker, nor may one speaker dominate, donate time to another speaker. If a speaker runs out of time, then the speaker may leave additional information with the board clerk. Statements reasonably perceived to be disruptive or imminently threatening to the orderly operation of the meeting shall not be permitted. Any limitation on public comment shall be viewpoint neutral. The board chair has the authority to rule the speaker out of order. If a speaker or attendee willfully interrupts, disturbs, or disrupts this meeting and refuses to leave after being asked by the board chair, then the speaker may be escorted out and could be arrested for trespassing or disrupting an official meeting. Board members will not respond to individuals who address the board except to request clarification of points made by the presenter. Our first speaker is Sabrina Berry. <coughs> Ms. Berry is not here. Our second speaker is Jeff Dixon. Jeff Dixon is not here. Our third speecher, speaker is David Polier. Welcome. see a timer so you let me know it started thank you members of the board I'm a resident of this county and not a second-class citizen my name so you can address me is David Polar jr. I'm a servant of the Most High and only God remember my name you will be speaking of it throughout your ranks as a defender of the faith and a protector of my flock, I call on you to hear these words. It's been three years since COVID-19 protocols and policies have been set before us. As one of a few, my family has notified in writing of our religious freedom to be exempt from your COVID policies. This is a state record. What I and my children have seen, experienced, and endured can only be expressed as atrocities by this government. My children have been ridiculed, berated, accosted, and violated by members of this body. We have seen and experienced the horrible actions of trusted officials, wolves in sheep's clothing, imposters of liberty and freedom, my family has participated throughout COVID in all of your silly new rules while legally not having to participate. What you have done to my family can only be described as an act of war. On any other battlefield, the accused would be hung on a stake and executed for their crimes against my children in the United States. My family has tested your COVID policies while being stripped continually for three years of our most basic of freedoms, and we live to tell about it. This story would take more than three minutes of your precious time, and it will be told, and all imposters will be brought to justice according to the law. You have been given my complaint. The wheat among us, among this body, must identify the weeds bundle them up and throw them into the fire to be burned. I cannot. It is forbidden for me. But you have been elected to do so by me. So hold fast to that oath you swore to uphold and protect for me. My children are at stake 
We need you to defend our rights. We will defend your right to do so. Should you choose this day no course of action, then you will be gathered together with the rest of the weeds and burned up together with them. Thus saith the Lord, we are at war. Who among you will show your fruit as wheat? Thank you. Ms. Sandage has a question for clarification. Good evening. I was just wanting to see, have, have your concerns that are listed here already been discussed at the school level or at the district level? Every single thing that has happened to my children, I have had talks with Mr. Playtech and Mr. Shue. Uh, I have notified somebody at the board here in order to get this thing kind of rolling. Where do I go from here? And that started on September 8th, after the last time my son was disciplined for nothing. It has been constant for three years. Two children in Central Cabarrus High School with exemptions. And you can imagine being kicked off of school buses. That Rosa Park stuff, it's 2023. It's not supposed to be happening now. And We've endured, 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 and it's broke up my family, and it's disgusting. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Not for me. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Alice Helms. Welcome. Okay. Good evening. As we move further into realignment, I ask you to prioritize stability and predictability over the next decade. Instead of a short-term solution to a decades-old problem, please plan long-term to set up stable school communities. I have two children at Charles E. Boger Elementary and a two-year-old, and Boger is a wonderful school that is harnessing momentum. Thank you to our teachers, administrators, and staff for setting the bar hack high academically and for behavior, for taking our kids on field trips this year, and for engaging our community. Kids are thrilled when Northwest football players open the car doors on select days, and my girls were swept off their feet by Northwest cheerleaders um, in a camp this fall. The vertical and geographical alignment of Boger and Northwest are models for creating stable school communities around the district, and we would love to stay there. However, although we attend Boger, my children are fifth generation residents of Odell School Road toward Highway 3. I want to clarify to the board and the people drawing the boundaries that not everyone on Odell School Road attends W.R. Odell anymore, and that's okay. What's unacceptable is that our section of Odell School Road has historically been a flip-flopped boundary line for realignments. This is what I'm asking you to stop and prevent. My neighbor's children were flipped three to four times over the course of their 13 years with CCS, either by re realignments or doubly by misalignments to middle school. Please do not do this to our community again and again over the next decade, especially for our families that do not live in new neighborhoods. Empower families with stability by implementing a long-term plan. You can do this by simplifying feeder patterns, planning approximate locations for future schools, creating large cohorts that will move together as we update facilities, and spreading resources around the district to make schools safer and more efficient. Realignment is not just about realigning students, it is about realigning resources and giving all students access to strong, comprehensive schools. All schools are aiming for excellence, but the equity data concerns me. Ask all of the questions and think long term. Ask how realignment impacts Title I funding. Question the funding and effects of, protect, of protected seats in programs of choice. While some of our traditional schools, which serve more students, um, lose classes in the arts and world language. Anticipate growth and use multiple realignment strategies. 
consistency and community. You guys can make some gutsy decisions to make long-term plans for our families. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, board members, we will move to 10.01. This is our action agenda. <clears throat> this is our school improvement plans with Dr. Jonathan Bowers. Good evening one more time. Um, so, um, <clears throat> board members, what, uh, what you have before you tonight, uh, we are bringing uh, this year's school improvement plans uh, to you for approval. Um, as you can see, we've talked over the months leading up to this for the last six months, as a matter of fact, about the continuous improvement process, about our school improvement process, about the work that's gone into this, about the efforts at the school level, and also uh, just again with the, uh, the intentionality and the alignment that I would speak to uh, with not only the State Board of Education strategic priorities, but the district strategic plan as well. Uh, so again, just a bit of a reminder, you know, if we talk about what was the effort this year and certainly what is the goal, it's moving away from a compliance driven model to one that's truly a continuous improvement model. And that really is at the heart of everything we do. And again, the schools have done a wonderful job embracing this. Again, when we speak of that alignment, we're looking across the state level, down to the district, to the very school itself. And so how these integrated parts come together to ensure that whatever the goals are that have been specified at the school level are truly those goals that are found within our district strategic plan, which then obviously is grounded within the work that takes place at the North Carolina State Board of Education with strategic priorities. Here we see again our strategic plan. And when we talk about what will be the focus, what will be the effort, what are those, those defined uh, pillars of Cabarrus County Schools from a uh, movement forward, it begins with student wellness, uh, teaching and learning. Obviously, you're looking at a diverse talent pipeline, our early learning programs, technology-enhanced learning, and then lastly, community alignment. Using this framework as the backdrop, once again, schools have taken, embarked upon this journey to ensure that where they land and for the plans that have been presented before you tonight have been vetted, they have been voted upon, and they have been reviewed by not only school-level staff, but also district staff as well. <coughs> Again, as a reminder, each school will have at least three school improvement goals that directly correlate and tie back to what will be the district strategic plan itself. And you can see one of those goals will be student wellness. Again, at the very forefront, making sure that students' uh, care and well-being, safety, is at the forefront of what we do every single day. Teaching and learning, obviously, that in itself is a major function of schools themselves. So, making sure that schools have intentionally identified what are going to be those learner-based outcomes that need to be the efforts for this year. And then the last element that schools had the freedom to choose is what would be their school choice. That which speaks to their community, that which speaks to their total populations to say, what is it that we know would enhance this environment or this, this process for our students as well. One of the things that has been included in the presentation for you tonight are just some um, statutory and board policy comparisons as well. Um, begins with state statute. That's where school improvement planning is defined. You go to Chapter 115C, Article 105, Section 27. It defines exactly what are the responsibilities of school districts when it comes to school improvement planning. And it stipulates and spells those out. Schools have been given this information. They began working on that last spring, carried that work into the summer, and then obviously we've seen it play out through the fall as staff returned as well. <laughs> Also, alongside that, we want to make sure we're also cognizant of what our state, or excuse me, our school board policy is. So when we look at school board policy 3420, or excuse me, 3430, it specifically mirrors the language that is included within state statute about school improvement planning. So when we talk about alignment, there is alignment in and of itself. Schools have adhered to that, they understand that, and they have honored those requirements that are laid out within the policy. School improvement assurances form. Every school then had to fill out what was going to be an assurances form that specified exactly. They attest that these <coughs> practices have laid out and they were honored, <coughs> excuse me, and they were taken into consideration at the school level. So when we speak of things such as having duty-free lunches, when we talk about duty-free instructional planning time, when we talk about the school improvement plan being approved by the staff, when we talk about there being measures in which the school leadership team is representative of the stakeholders in that school, a representation of the school's principal, the assistant principals, the certified staff, the teachers, parents. 
when you think about all of those members, each of the schools have developed their teams and they are representative according to statute. And then the other obligations that have been spelled out. Safety plan is included, not which is made available. You won't see that as part of this plan, but they do have those in place at the school level as well. And the other multitude of offerings that have to be honored. You see the our direction reports that have been linked there for you as well, which again, as I explain our synopsis of our school improvement plans, and it gives you a nice, clean, tight review of exactly what schools have identified as their priorities for this upcoming year. And within each of those goals, it then has a performance measure and an expected outcome associated. So they can progress their monitor, through, mo progress monitor their way throughout and know whether or not they are moving towards the advancement and the stated outcome there. The comprehensive reports have been included here for the fuller version. And then lastly, one piece to this is the NC Star login. I put it there for Cox Mill Elementary School, just so that you know, when you click on that particular link, it will take you to each school's home page in our district. And from each of our school's home pages, when you go to the top left of the website, it will have about our school listed there. And you hover over that, it drops down, and you will find there's a link for school improvement plan included. You click on that link for school improvement plan, it takes you to their school improvement plan website. There's a guest login there for NC Star. You log in using the credentials that are identified, and you can see, or any member of the community can see, the plans as presented and go through and see with certainty exactly what that school is prioritizing for the upcoming year real time. So these, excuse me, I'm sorry, these resources have been made available. I'll share them with you tonight just so you can get a sense of exactly the, again, the comprehensive planning and the comprehensive work that has gone into these uh, plans thus far. This right here is just a timeline that just captures everything that I've shared with you up to this point. Again, not to sound like a broken record and certainly sound redundant here, but again, process beginning last May and continuing up through here tonight. And you can see at each interval along the way what is taking place with, again, thoughtful, intentional planning that really has invoked a very collective effort. This is not singular. It's not one person sitting in an office developing these outs. We have seen this play out, and I just marvel again at the work that the schools have put forth with uh, the plans that they bring forth tonight. So with that, I'll pause for any questions. Any questions, Mr. Floyd? The timeline, so when is the, for the benefit of the public, specifically when is the school improvement plan go into place? Great question, Mr. Floyd. So it really, the efforts start taking place day one. Right. <laughs> so this is not one in which That's the point I want to make. Yes, sir. We have not. Start in November. Yeah, yeah we're not starting school time. after approval, so. This process actually started, this year's school improvement plans actually started last June. Yeah. So when we, we hit the ground running, when we opened up in August, we were prepared to start talking about what we, we're not talking about actually implementing what we're talking about today, but we still need the board to approve the final version. Yes. Yes, sir, you're exactly right. For those still watching out there in YouTube, man. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Mr. Walter? Yeah, so what, what's on here, though, that you're asking us to approve looks like a summary. Is that what we're at? Is that the school improvement plan? You're, you, you have that other slide that was helpful to me because I did read the policy, and then I looked at the policy, and I said, well, how do I align that, what you're asking me to approve with what the policy says? So help me understand that. I know you said this uh, assurance form covers a lot of the items that are in. Yes, sir. It does. But the, I mean, the policy said there's supposed to be two parts to the school improvement plan. I didn't see two parts to the or, or being approved. Yes, sir. So what we shared, what we elected to share was going to be more of a concise view of what the goals and what this year's efforts and performance measures were going to be, which were at the heart of the school improvement plans themselves. Some of the other things to which you referenced or more of the compliance-driven efforts, and those, those are indeed are in place. I certainly don't want to mislead and suggest that hasn't been done. But the effort of this was to really bring attention to what were going to be the specific efforts at the school level, what their priorities were, what their measures were, and what their action steps and best practices were going to be in order to achieve those outcomes. Because the action steps I don't think are on there either. It's just well, what the, the key indicators. What the, what the goal is, which is good. Yes, sir. And I know the work is I we, we went we looked and we sat in sat in the, the meetings and sure. there's a lot of work going on there's a lot a lot of people that care and, and are digging into the data which was outstanding to me 
Um, I just want to make sure that we have a policy that goes into pretty much detail on what a, what a plan's supposed to look like. So and the if I'm the public and I look at this three-page yep. thing, it doesn't. How do I get it to sh show me that it aligns with that? So if you go to the NC Star Comprehensive Reports, that gives you the uh, that gives you the details. So when you click on that, Mr. Walter, that'll give you all the reports. Okay. If you yeah, download, bring one up. if you download that, they're 22 let's, pages in length. Uh, and let's bring one up. JT Allen, you can bring up. And that will show you all the information you're talking about. It has the mission, the vision, the goals. It will have all the detail that's in there, the core function, the, the, the various dimensions that are in there, the alignment to the NC STAR, the initial assessments that are on there, all the actions that are taking place, um, and all the notes. It also gives you a timeline. It goes back to the history of all the improvement plans that yes, are sir. there as well. So you could check the history and see you know, some of what, what has been taking place at that particular school. The R direction report that you have that's the short condensed version, as Dr. Bauer so elegantly put it, that, that's the, so the compliance piece is, is the policy piece, we're, we're, you know, we, which is all there, and that's all the, the, the things you can click on, all the links, but we're after the outcome piece, and the outcome piece, really, we're trying to show you the condensed version of the goals that are there. So you'll see an academic goal, you'll see a social emotional wellness goal, and you'll also see, and that social emotional is tied to the student wellness goal and strategic plan. The academic goal is tied to the teaching and learning piece of the strategic plan, back to the school's school improvement plan, so we have alignment. And then the last one was school choice as to what the administrators and teachers felt to some of the work that you observed this summer, what they felt was a need to be addressed in their school. So you'll see a lot of those different things. Could be restorative practices, could be discipline, could be um, working on a PBS plan, could be working on their, some of the data from the panorama survey, could be um, attendance, could be many different things. But these plans you see in front of you, that's the comprehensive piece that you're re referencing that's there for you to review. And they're all there. If you, if you click on it, our intent was let's show the board the condensed version. So. Um, yeah, but you're, okay, we were, we were at, what I've reviewed has only been the condensed version. It hasn't been the full school improvement plan. Okay. So I would have liked to have had the chance to review a school improvement plan if that's what we're asking, being asked to approve. That, approve. But I am glad that that work is there, and I'm glad it's there. I didn't know that until just yes, this yeah. presentation, yeah. so thank you. I can, thank you. I can assure you as a superintendent that this work has been done in full faith. I think Ms. Fugger could probably speak to some of this for West Cabarrus High School, if you would. Um, I was invited to sit in um, on the work session um, back in June, was it June, May? Yes, ma'am, that's right. Um, at the initial, I was asked to step in and um, support West Cabarrus in writing our goals. Um, and so we definitely used the feedback from the panorama survey to identify what our students were saying and our um, families were saying. And that helped us to create our goals uh, for West. Um, and so now we can use uh, those goals to make sure that the teachers are implementing the different strategies um, to increase our communication, uh, making sure that our lessons are supporting students, um, and we're just identifying, you know, the students that are at risk so that they have um, a safe person at school. Um, so I think that we're striving to do that, and thankfully we had, a, within the guidelines, obviously, we had... Um, some choice in what the goals were for our school and I think that that's important because what's happening at West is not going to be the same across the board and so um, within the parameters I definitely think that that was uh, well thought out and I appreciated that opportunity um, and we, d we definitely did use the data um, from each of the surveys to cr create those. Okay. I mean don't get me wrong I appreciate the work and I can see that a whole lot of work went into it. Well, I'm just saying what I've been asked to approve wasn't the plan, so it was a summary. Any other questions, board members? Okay. Since we're in a work session and business session, we're going to vote on this individually. I need a motion to approve the school improvement plan as presented. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Escobar, a second by Ms. Lindsay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the school improvement plans are approved. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you for your support. We'll move to 10.02, policies for approval on first reading. Hello, Dr. Ward. 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, before I start, we only have one policy tonight, but I wanted to give you sort of an update on where we are with the policy committee. We do meet this week on Thursday. Um, Thursday, we will be wrapping up um, our review of the seven policies that were mostly impacted by the Parents' Bill of Rights. We have really taken our time since September to really delve into those policies. Um, we did not rush through. We wanted to make sure um, that the policies represent not only the statute and the law, but also um, meets Cabarrus County standards as well. So um, I will be bringing you those um, updated policies next month. So I just wanted to give you an update on where we are. We also did just receive last week the fall PLS updates. So we'll be moving along. There's about 20 or 23 policies that are there. So um, we'll be moving and shaking with those. So for this evening, I am bringing up for you uh, policy 6402, which speaks to the participation by historically utilized businesses. Underutilized. Underutilized. What else? Utilized. Utilized. Underutilized. Look at that. Look at you. Uh, and Mr. <laughs> Mr. Penn is here, just in case we had any questions. But I just wanted to kind of speak a little bit to the policy. Um, our our group, our policy committee, we really talked about um, the percentage that um, we felt like Cabarrus County should be shooting for when engaging with historically underutilized businesses. That would be 10 percent. Um, Section A talks about what are the steps, what are the good faith efforts that we are going to employ in order to do that because we can say one thing, do another. <coughs> we want to make sure that we have some outline steps and PLS has really helped us kind of hone in on that, which is really good. Um, and lastly, Section B just talks about the documentation and how we will be able to submit those reports to you. Um, and I brought up Mr. Penn in case you had any technical questions that I cannot answer about finance <laughs> and our purchase practices. Any questions, board members? I have a question. Ms. Lindsay. <laughs> It's late. I'm sorry, I'm a little. Um, so I have a question about this, and maybe this might be a legal question too. But um, it, I, I just, you know, I don't have a problem supporting any businesses that are going to be the business that is going to give us the best service, the best product, whatever the case may be. But it seems a little, you know, when we say at the very top, we're going to do 10% of our business with female-owned businesses, but then in the second paragraph it says we're going to purchase our goods without regard to sex. Like, that's a little, I mean, that's, it doesn't really make sense to me. So if somebody could explain that, that would be great. I'll defer on the legal part of it, but to <laughs> me the key word in there is aspires. Right, that, that that was the key word. It doesn't say it's not a, it's not a binding it's not a binding thing that we're after, but we're trying to say, let's make sure we're trying to utilize these services where we can. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't take the low cost supplier on this type of thing, right? It factors into that decision. And, and when I look back at what we spent over the last five quarters, because I had that data available to me, we're actually in the high single digits right now. We were over the ten percent aspiration in two of the last five. So we're kind of close already. I think this codifies some of the steps that we might be able to take to make sure that we're reaching the audience that we want to try and reach on these historically underutilized businesses. I'll, I'll defer to Attorney Middleworks on the rest. I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, which is y you are required, because you're spending public money, to adhere to certain guidelines, including um, among other things, non-discriminatory ones. But what these kinds of policies promote is a good deal of educating business owners about how to work with school districts and public monies and what the bidding processes are and what the contracting processes are so that you are doing a good job of widening your supplier base, which is when you're looking for the lowest qualified bidder or supplier, the wider the base you have, the more competitive you're going to be in that marketplace and the more sources that you can go to, which ultimately will help, should help save taxpayer money. That's, right. that's, that's the goal of, of 
a program like this is is building or, or helping the marketplace expand so that you have more qualified choices to pick from. But it does seem confusing. It, it, does, it says notwithstanding. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. I, I agree. With Mr. Walter. Um, are these vendor lists public? Can the public see what the, the list you put together under yeah. number seven there? I believe that is public information. If it's not, we'll make it public. Okay, and then my two suggestions was under under number one of A, can we add that, make sure it's on our website? I assume it already is, but if it isn't, yeah, pretty sure that is you can say that in policy, really available on the Cambridge County Schools website. Mm -hmm. And the second one is to be consistent with the 6442 instead of NC Department of Administration, it's State Department of Administration. That's just if you want to be consistent. Okay, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions, board members? Okay, we are going to vote on this. I need a motion to approve the policy 6402 as presented with additional corrections as stated. I'll make the motion. Need a second? Second. I have a motion by Mr. Walter, a second by Ms. Escobar. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move to 10.03, contract renewal for cybersecurity with Mr. Ben Aldrin. Good evening. Good evening. So as we were um, sitting here tonight, uh, I got a report that comes every week from this platform, and I was looking at the data points um, that get looked at in our district, and the number is 863 million data points get reviewed on a weekly basis. So I did a little math. That means we've had about 20 million data points uh, just since we started the meeting uh, tonight. And the, the good thing about that, uh, we got Curtis here with us. He's one of our four engineers. It means the other three engineers can be with their families and go to ball games and cook dinners and uh, probably go to bed um, while this happens in the background. Um, so I've learned so much in the last year and a half. K-12-6 is a national organization that looks at cyber threats and cyber attacks, ransomware, breaches, phishing, uh, just in K-12. So you can see that number, over 1,600 just between the years of 2016 and 2022. Now, I'd like to say that this isn't close to home, but it is close to home. So you can uh, go visit that if you want to and, and do a little research. But this happens uh, in our county and other counties around us across North Carolina and all over the world. Uh, any, any article you read about this will say 16 is probably very, very low because nobody wants to report it. Right? Nobody wants to report it. Last week, uh, two weeks ago at least, we, we had some slow internet. It took us about three days to figure that out because nobody wants to say we're the reason the internet is slow. So um, that number is probably a lot faster. You guys think that's funny? We were saying Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I was saying it too. <laughs> This report came out this year. So COSIN is a, a networking organization for educators um, that helps us do all the behind the scenes work. We have a instructional organizations. So in uh, alignment with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security um, and CISA, which is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, you can see the vast increases since 2016 to 2021 for data breaches, ransomware, et cetera. We get hit all the time. We have a map in our office. Um, some of you visit our office. It sits in there and it's got a visual that shows the number of attacks that come in all over the place. It's, it's hundreds of thousands, millions uh, on the week. So uh, inside of this report from the Department of Homeland Security and CISA, it recommends that we do some things. And so every time I meet with Dr. Kapicki, he always says, have a plan, have a plan, have a plan for when something happens. Um, Arctic Wolf is, is part of that plan. We are implementing multi-factor authentication, which is one of the first things we should do to um, password security. I'm sure everyone in here has a 13-digit password with uppercase, lowercase on every one of their accounts. I do not. Um, we prioritize fixing things when they break. Um, we perform test backups. We have local backups, backups at our local government, backups in the cloud. 
Um, we have a cyber incident response plan, and um, some of you may have clicked a button and gotten a little training from no before, a phishing thing, so uh, those happen. So we train our folks. But Arctic Wolf um, is what makes sure that we are both reactive, um, and let me just go back to the beginning. That's the manage detection and risk, and then response, and then proactive. How? What's the risk that we're under? Um, this we just did last two months ago in September. So MCNC is the backbone of internet for uh, K-12 post-secondary. It is our provider. So when you go and you have Spectrum or Windstream at home, that's your internet service provider. We get ours from NCNC. Um, they have great resources for us. They send a team out and they audit us and give us feedback. You can see that in 2020, we had a score of 38. This is out of 100, so we would have failed that if we were in high school. Um, now we have a score of 77, which is an increase of over 40 points. And every one of those, you'll see a no or partial to a yes is specifically because we implement uh, systems like Arctic Wolf um, and others that we have in our layers of security. I've sent those layers of security uh, to you over the course of the year um, as we go. Um, this breaks this down into a very digestible chunk. We have, like I said, we have a team of four engineers. We have 35,000 students. We have over 4,000 employees. We probably have 100,000 plus devices online at any given time. Most of you don't have one device online right now. You have two, maybe three, or like me, you have four devices online while we're sitting in a room. So you can see that, that number I gave you, but as we move down the vulnerabilities to the investigation to the reported incidents, it means that on my team, Justin, Curtis, Josh, and Mickey have to look at 50 things uh, over the course of a week and not 800 million things over the course of the week. Um, painting the picture for you that uh, these are really vital systems for us. Um, Systems like uh, Arctic Wolf mean that um, we could never employ the people that do this for the money that we have in education. So uh, during the Super Bowl or while you're watching TV, you always see these uh, ADT or Simply Safe commercials come on, and you know, you're out at work, you're taking your kids to school, and there's that camera in the house, and that intruder starts to break down the door. Somebody comes off in the intercom and says, "Stay away from that house," and the alarm goes off. Arctic Wolf is like the Simply Safe for the ADT for our network that you have at home. It's 24-7 monitoring. And uh, just while I was in here, I was looking at the tickets. Uh, we had a ticket come in today, and it said, we noticed this. How can we help you? We've blocked this. Tell us what to do next. So their team of experts make sure that we are safe. So um, the reason I tell you that is because things like this cost a lot of money. They're expensive. We evaluate these things every year. Uh, we try to make sure that we're spending our money judiciously. Um, but we also know that uh, if we were to have a ransomware, if we were to have a breach, how valuable is our data, our students' data, our staff's data? And I would say that it's invaluable. So I want to answer any questions. And of course, there's an action item to approve the contract for us this year. This is a renewal. We've been doing business with Arctic Wolf since 2020. Um, it's never come to you all because it's been under our threshold of $250,000. So it goes up every year, and we have more kids every year and more devices. Mr. Walter. Yeah, thanks, Ben, for the uh, presentation. Um, so it's a three-year contract or a one-year contract? One-year contract. Just a one-year contract for that. Um, and it's based on the number of users or the number of devices? Or how's, so, it, how's it priced? Uh, the price breaks out. You'll see the number of 5,500 units. That is... Uh, devices by staff, that is the network intrusions, it's um, looking at virtual sensors, physical sensors at the government center, it looks at um, our virtual servers, it, we put sensors physically or virtually on every data point or, or access point you can for in our district. So access points, not necessarily the actual machines, right? Not the actual machines, I, I mean entry point, uh, it gets very technical. I can't even pretend to say that I fully understand the technicality of it, but in order for information to get in our system and out of our system, it goes through ports, and those ports are controlled. And these sensors monitor those ports for traffic in and out, and they look for those irregularities, those attacks, uh, those known and unknown things, irregularities, things like that. And then they raise those to a level of awareness for us, and then our team can work with theirs to remedy those. And is it is it budgeted? Is, is it yes, it's a budgeted item. And 
as I've heard. Essentially, I've heard it's a, it's a pretty good program, but they tend to, that's one of the more expensive ones. They tend, yeah, to, they tend to increase their price quite a bit they every do. year. Uh, they have a, a prescribed annual increase of 8 to 10% plus if we add anything. If you know anything about Gartner or Forrester, Gartner has their magic quadrant. Um, this is one of those tools that lives in the upper right of the magic quadrant. It's, it's not an emerging technology. It's not a new technology. Uh, it is a proven uh, industry leader. And they have other services apparently they offer too. They do. We take advantage of two of them, uh, MDR, which is managed detection uh, and managed risk. Thank you. Ms. Sandage. I'm just guessing this is the lowest bid. This or are we just the, continuing yeah, to use is this? This is one of those products that you don't start it and then let it go, right? You continue that. So a couple years ago, uh, that was put into place. Um, it's also the type of product that's more than likely a single source. Um, nobody else typically does what most of these systems do. So this is. But I pro yes, we, we actually. Um, I've been, agonizing is not the right word. When you spend a quarter million dollars on anything every year, you're going to look at what it is. So uh, even today, uh, Mickey and Dawn, our treasurer, and I were talking over these things, talking to the company. Uh, what does this look like for us? Are, are there any additional discounts? We kind of go back and forth on that. Uh, the way these vendors work is they go through primary resellers. Uh, we go to the different resellers, um, get the quotes, take the lowest bid. Okay, so that's a bit over my head, but I think I understand what you're saying. I just want to make sure like five years from now, you're going to be bringing another bid for this same company. What we will do I'm is... I'm just saying we like... We look at it every year. Okay, so we look at different vendors. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Escobar. So, so just to piggyback on that, so there's no other vendor that is comparable to this? We might find comparable vendors um, that might do six tenths, seven tenths, eight tenths. Um, with the limited staff we have, um, we don't want to be um, we don't want to be in a position where we're having to recover data. So this is when we prioritize. Um, I'll give you a good example. We looked at a system last year that looks at permissions. Uh, you start a, you, you create a file on your computer, you share it with a couple of people, you put it in a folder, um, somehow you create another file in the same folder that's shared with a ton of people, and it's got information you didn't want to share. Well, that happens times 40,000 people in our district. Uh, instead of spending $125,000 to $200,000 on a product, we found another way with free resources that we found through MCNC, through the Friday Institute, through Department of Public Instruction, uh, through this uh, group called the Strike Team uh, that works across industry. So whenever something like this comes up, the first thing we're going to do is, are there free resources? And this is not something that comes for free. That makes sense. It yeah. does make sense. And so I appreciate the work that you do to make sure that what you're presenting to us is the best um, and that this is a necessary cost. So thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Treadaway. I'm just curious, does this also protect uh, operational things like timekeeper, time, uh, payroll, yes. uh, all that kind of stuff yes. too? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so we are going to take a vote on this. I need a motion to approve the contract renewal cybersecurity as presented. So move. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Floyd, a second by Ms. Lindsay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The contract is approved. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll move to 10.04, recommendation and approval of the Opportunity School Architectural Design Team. Mr. Tim Lauder. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairman and board members. Um, I, I'm coming for you tonight to uh, present our recommendation for the um, architectural design services team for the Opportunity School. As you're aware, we, we were funded this year for that, that, that project to start next summer. Uh, we will hopefully uh, begin with get the design done and be ready to start construction once that funding is available to us. We had nine uh, proposals. I'm um, sorry, my narrative says six. That was my, my error because we got another proposal after it's got six, and this was nine. And uh, of those nine firms, a couple were new to our, our system this year. But uh, under our scoring system, the person, one that came out on top was, uh, was Morrisburg Architecture. And that's very fortunate for us because 
we, we were looking to model the, the Opportunity School after the PLC. It just so happens that Morris Berg was also the uh, uh, architect of record for the PLC, so that's very fortunate they both came out on top and it would probably work very, we feel like it's a very, very good fit for this project, so therefore we are recommending that you allow us to begin negotiations on scope and contract to bring that back to you at next month's meeting. Any questions, board members? Miss Lindsay? Um, are we going to, so normally when we do this, um, we get to see a presentation by the architects, right? Like we'll, we'll see that and we'll kind of go over it and then vote on that. So I guess I'm just wondering why that process was a little bit different this time. One, that process happened like two times. Uh, normally, you, we, we come to you and make a recommendation based upon what we do. We, we've had some previous leadership in, in, uh, in the board that wanted to see it personally. Uh, but we feel like that, um, one, we know the firms, we get to see the firms, and this is a small project compared to some of the ones you get, or some of the projects, the last two you saw were $100 million projects. This was a kind of a small project, it's a niche project, and we felt like as a staff that we felt pretty good about this recommendation, so it comes to us as a recommendation. We have another project that's starting next week, which will be the revolving the old R. Brown McAllister, and that will be coming in with interviews and that sort of thing because it is a bigger project, a bigger scope, and a different type of project. So this one we felt like was small enough, and we had enough knowledge of the firms to be able to come to you with a recommendation without having to go through all that for that smaller project. This project is about a seven million dollar project. Seven. Million. Seven. Seven. <laughs> seven million. Still, still, still. It's expensive. Yes, it's just yeah. Miss Sandage. I'm glad that we had some new um, bidders for for this process, but I will tell you, I'm tired of seeing the same names of companies doing work for us over and over again. So just hear me saying that. I understand that. Um, but you also have to understand that some of the companies we have working for are very, very good companies. They very understand our process. And so when they make presentations, they run a very, very thorough scope of what they're willing to do. So it's very obvious that they've done their homework and they understand what we're doing. So therefore, they have a tendency to rise to the top because they have knowledge of our system. Whereas some of the new firms come in and, quite frankly, four or five of the proposals were, were boilerplate. I mean, I used to be in a consulting business, and I know they just send you a boilerplate, like, this is what we do, boo, 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 boo. Well, if you don't do that, you're not in business. <laughs> but, you know, they really didn't get into the nitty gritty and start talking to us about our project and what they felt was necessary for our project to become a reality, which uh, uh, and we're very fortunate to have a couple of uh, four really good firms that we've used pretty frequently, and they seem to rise to the top of the way. Point still remains the same. I hear you. I understand. Mr. Walter? Um, can you share with us who was on the evaluation committee and what the criteria you used to evaluate? Yes, sir, we, we use about the same evaluation form we use all the time. It's just it's a criteria that talks about the scope, the proximity, their experience, uh, their availability, their, their time schedule. Those are all the same factors we use. We use that same score. Right, for, 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 the public, for the public, though, what, just not to yes, repeat, repeat it so we know. We know. Yes, yes, sir, we've done that. Uh, the buying cone, uh, Ms. Dottie Bramhall and the construction department, myself, Mr. Harold Hone, and Dr. Bowers were on that review committee for this. Four? four. Five people. Five. Five. Okay, any other questions, board members? Ms. Escobar? And to clarify, where is this going to be built? Undecided. Okay. Uh, we are looking at two different locations. Uh, uh, obviously, we own property next to the PLC, but uh, we also are looking at other properties that may be a little bit closer to the existing proximity of that building that we have out of the old high school, or we call it the Opportunity School now. So we're evaluating that depending on what the price of the property is, it may be advantageous to go back to the PLC. We have property already there. Okay. So when we see plans, oh, um, yes, we'll know by then. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. So the architects for engineering selection criteria was based on professional qualifications was 40% of the score. The project approach was 40% of the score. The performance and relationships was 20%. And then the partnerships was listed at the bottom for overall comments on the quality of the submittal and the impression. Um, all of those breakdowns were provided to the board in the midweek update that we just started. So that was given to you all to take a look at. So if you want to reference, go back at it. You can see all the individual breakdowns of those around the committee and their scores. 
which gives it the aggregate totals that are in front of you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, it's time to vote on this. I need a motion to approve the re recommendation for the architectural design team as presented. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Floyd, a second by Ms. Lindsay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, the recommendation has been approved. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. We'll go to 10.05 Central Cabarrus High School Tennis Court Surface Contract with Mr. Brian Cohn. Good evening, Good Madam evening. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Kapicki. Uh, the Department of Construction <laughs> received bids for the Central Cabarrus High School Tennis Court Resurfacing Project that was approved as a part of this year's Cabarrus County's 2023 PAYGO projects. Quality Seal Coating and Sports Surfaces LLC out of Penhook, Virginia was the low bid for the installation of the ProBounce monolithic <coughs> surfacing system. Once approved, they will begin prep work on the courts to try their best to have them ready for the spring season. We have worked with school staff in the athletic department on the chances that that is not ready to make alternative plans to be able to play in case we can't get them 100% complete. So with that said, we are requesting the approval of the contract in the amount of $418,612 with quality seal coating and sports services LLC as presented for the Central Cabarrus High School Tennis Court Project. It's a part of your board agenda packet. The contract and their quotes are in there, as well as information on the system that will be installed on those courts. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions, board members? Mr. Walter? Hey Brian, thank you for that. Yes. Um, when I went to the, what is there, page eight, I had a couple of questions on, on on that when I read that. Are they expecting us to prepare the surface for them so there's an additional cost? Because there's yeah. a bunch of cracks in that current asphalt, right? Or so so the, the preparations that he's referencing is the two new courts, the two added courts that we built for them over there because Central Cabarrus only had four courts. We added two additional courts, so we obligated ourselves to install the asphalt for those two courts. And that's the preparation CC. So they're about. fixing the other courts. And then he'll be crack repairing and fixing the other courts, yes, sir. Okay, that was the one question. The other one, so it's a five year warranty. What's the life of this surface? So this is, uh, so we did some vetting of this process with uh, uh, other groups that have used it before. Uh, specifically, we asked for firms that had installed it um, uh, at least 10 years ago and what their the, 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 the life span of the product was and what they'd had to do to it. Um, they both said that, uh, I think we talked to one company that had it installed in 2012 and they've not had to do any repairs on it other than just recoding the surface from fading. So, it, you know, they, they bill it as a five-year warranty but said it is a 10 to 15-year life on this product. Okay, and then the last one. That Help me understand. It says the speed of the court can be determined by the owner. Who made that determination? Because, I mean, there it seems to be you can make a competitive advantage if you do something to your court that other courts aren't doing. So, so the court plays just like a hard court surface. So, so what, the, what, the is that, what is that? What is that? Probably the speed with which the player can play is going to determine how fast. Uh, that's not what this says, but okay. Speed of the courts can be changed and is decided by the owner, is what it said. Yeah, yeah they'll, be, they'll be installed just like a hard court. It's going to play just like a hard court surface. So. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, we'll take a vote on this. I need a motion to approve the CCHS tennis court contract as presented. So, so moved. moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Escobar, a second by Mr. Floyd. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Contract is approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. We'll go to 11.01 .01, to convene in closed session. Board members, we will move to 11.01. .01. I need a motion that the board convene in closed session to consult with the attorneys proceeding to General Statute 143-318-11A3 and to include discussion of the KMK, Quinonas, Sutton, and Wanish cases and pension litigation and to consider confidential personnel matters proceeding to General Statute 143-318-11A6. So moved. Okay. 
I have a motion by Mr. Floyd, a second by Ms. Lindsay. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? We are now in closed session. Thank you.